And all these materials, at least to the best of my ability, have been made for version 23.1 of Gem 5, which is the latest release. Uh, maybe if you refer to these notes in a year's time, there'll be something that's slightly different. But uh, if you check out that major release of Gem 5, you should be fine. I suppose just a little bit about me, so you know who is talking to you guys for the next six hours or so. Uh, my name is Bobby Bruce. I wish you probably had that on the slide, not just my face. Uh, I work at UC Davis as a project scientist. Uh, I started that in 2019, and I started as a postdoc and I moved up to project scientist. And I spent almost all my week, my working life working on Gen 5 in some capacity. Uh, so, and there's probably not many people who are paid to do that. As I'll explain, Gen 5 is massively collaborative, massive, massively open source and a collaborative project. And most people will maybe dedicate a few hours of development time. Uh, so I'm one of the few people who works in this full time. So am I a Gen 5 expert? Absolutely not. Uh, Gen 5 is absolutely huge. It's been in development forever. There's areas of the code I do not understand very well. And I suppose I'm putting this here as if you are learning how to use Gen 5 and there isn't a point where you feel slightly lost, you're either a genius or incredibly stupid. Because I never know anyone who doesn't get a bit scared and lost. And some of the designs in Gen 5 are so uh, weird and unique that, yeah. But, I'm tr but in this tutorial, I'm going to try my best to really uh, hold your hand and get you through this. And hopefully, you can start the ground running away if you want to use Gem 5 for. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, for those who came from abroad, yeah. and for those who are not very good at English, yes. if you just try to be more clearly pronouncing, okay. it would be helpful. Yep. Uh, apologies for my Scottish accent. Um, I will. I will. Uh, yes. I thought I'd be okay since I'm back in my home home turf. But uh, I will. Yes. I'll speak more slowly and clearly. Thank you for pointing that out. And uh, yes. Uh, I'll say this. I think I say this in a couple of slides. But I don't mind this being semi-interactive. So please put up your hands or if you have any clarifying questions. Doesn't mean I can help clarify, but it might help provoke discussion. So. First things first, what is Jam 5? Uh, and I think this pretty much sums up enough for me to be happy. The Jam 5 architecture simulator provides a platform for evaluating computer systems by modeling the behavior of underlying hardware. It enables researchers to simulate the performance and behavior of complex computer systems, including the CPU, memory system, and in interconnects. This makes it possible to study the performance of different microarchitecture and architecture choices as well as the effects of different workloads without having to build and test real systems. And I guess I made this slide about a year ago, but like I was very, everyone's very shocked when I said that's literally what ChatGPT gives you if you ask what Gen 5 is. But now everyone's very, everyone's very numbed to ChatGPT's genius, but it got a very good definition. Probably better than if, it, if someone had challenged me to sum it up in two sentences. So that's Gen 5. Uh, First of all, what are we going to do today? Um, I went back and forth reshuffling this agenda uh, in the past few weeks, but this is basically what we're going to go through all, all today. And I think it touches very nicely on almost all major aspects of the project. Uh, just for the record, uh, we run, uh, well, we've only done it once, but we're going to run it again this year, a Gem 5 boot camp in the summer, which is supposed to give people a pretty good understanding of Gem 5. And that's five full days of intensive stuff like this. So it's impossible to cover every single part of the project or even everything I would like to in a single day. So uh, if you have things that you're trying to get done, again, catch me, catch me in a break. There are materials out there. They're sometimes hard to find. I can, something, I can point, point you in the right direction. So just go through. We're going to go through a short history of Gen 5. We're going to go uh, how to set up your system. We're going to use a pre-built system in Gem 5 as a very toy example to start off with. I'm going to explain how the event-driven simulator in Gem 5 works. I'm going to show you how to interpret the statistical outputs and the outputs of Gem 5. We're going to create a system using the standard library components. We're going to look again at statistical outputs. I'm going to discuss the differences and nuances in SE mode and FS mode, that's statistical emulation mode and full system mode. We're going to go over ways to speed up your simulation using checkpointing, lower fidelity components, KVM mode, and sampling. 
I'm going to have you create your own sim object. If you don't know what that is, there's a few slides coming up where I explain. You're going to create your own standard library component. I'm going to go over Gem5 resources, and that shouldn't be how to continue to Gem5, that should be how to contribute to Gem5. Uh, so yes, feel, feel, feel free to speak up. Discussion is good. Uh, I don't have all the answers, though. So yeah, as I say, no one's a genius at this. I'll try my best to answer your questions. I find in these things, some people have really, really specific questions that it's embarrassing. I can't answer them. But again, I'll try my best. A little bit of history. Uh, so we like to say that Gen 5 has been around for like 24 years. But that's really because the predecessor was two pieces of software, the GEMS simulator, which was a uh, modeling detailed memory systems, and the M5 simulator, which was a, a more general tool for simulating systems, but the memory simulation system wasn't very good. Uh, so uh, M5 was uh, University of Michigan, Michigan University, I don't know, uh, the, but given the logo, and I believe the other one was University of Wisconsin. Uh, M5 is an old Star Trek reference, apparently. Yeah, so now we're stuck with that forever. But it did make nice because you can put M5 on the end of gems, and it, that's how you get gem 5. And that happened, that merger happened in 2011. Uh, so, in my opinion, quite a long project. It has been under continual development. You can go into the Git log. Like, this project precedes Git they actually moved all their old SVN commits onto Git to make it all work. Uh, it's been under continual development for quite some time, and but uh, but it's now in the Gem Five state, which is a detailed memory system with a pretty good system, pretty good infrastructure for uh, simulating systems. Again, just to say over the uh, entire history, we've had about twenty-one thousand commits, and of those, about four hundred unique people contributing as far as we can estimate given the logs. And these can, we are quite strict in commits going in, so that's quite a substantial number of development. Um, Gen5 is a true public infrastructure project. And you know, when I started this, so when I started really computer science, I guess, I thought, oh, open source projects are all like like anyone can jump in and make a contribution and we're all happy and dancing in a circle. And I realize most open source projects don't work like that at all. They're very hierarchical. They don't allow people really to contribute who aren't in this core group. But they're normally, you know, a bunch of experts in the field and they're contributing. But Gen5 is one of the ones that it's truly open source. You, it's open in the sense you can look at the source code. It's also open in the sense you, that you can contribute. You can push a PR to Gen5, which I'll go over how you do and what the procedures are there. And we will at least review it. We might not accept it, but it won't be based on your status in society. It'll just be based on the contribution itself. It's free, like beer. Uh, we give it away for free. All our funding is government funding. We make no money off of this Gen5 directly. It's all donations. So I'm not saying we're a charity. We, we do pretty well, but it's free. and. Uh, I think it's pretty good because nah, I see no reason why a proprietary software couldn't have dominated this space at some point. That's massively collaborative, I'd say. You know, anyone can jump in, jump out. That's very common. We have people jump in for like a few months, do something, and leave, and we never hear of them again. It's just a pretty standard procedure. So who uses Gen5 and why would you use it? Honestly, you can use Gen5 for pretty much anything. It's an event-based simulator. You could even use it to simulate things that aren't necessary computer systems if you really wanted to. I see people use it for all sorts of stuff. But in general, I think it kind of boils down to three categories of users. First is education users, the academic research, or, la or government labs, so to say, and the industrial research and development. So in education is pretty straightforward. We use this a lot in our computer architecture courses. And a very typical like first like computer architecture 101 class will be load up a Gen5 simulation with uh, a small cache, uh, run the program, see how long it takes, then do it again with a larger cache and plot your data points. And you can extrapolate from there that cache, bigger caches are good, but eventually you kind of the cache stops being particularly useful. 
uh, and all sorts of things like that. Because uh, I don't know where you guys come from, but the university I work at can't afford to have students uh, with foundries able to make their chip designs and see if they work just to prove little points. We have to use simulation. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it is. Uh, so that's what education uses it for. Uh, academic research, I don't think I need to explain too much for this, but it's obvious that uh, act research is uh, a cyclical thing. You're constantly trying new things in an iterative way. Uh, you can't really do that in hardware. If you can, you'll do it in mathematics and try to prove your architecture stuff then. But the in-between is simulation, and that's just where we are. So that's basically academic research. Uh, I've got a slide coming up where, oh, is it just this next one? Yeah, we did a survey. I want to get this right. It was twenty. It was it was it was two years ago, and we surveyed the top architecture conferences. And we found seventy percent of all computer architecture research utilizes simulation in some capacity. And Gen Five was by far the most popular. We included in that people who kind of hack Gen Five to get it to want what they wanted to do, which is fine. You're allowed to do it. It's open source. But Gen Five is by far the most popular solution. Uh, but there's still room for improvement. Uh, roll their own, as in people just make, I, I, I review these papers all the time, people just make their own simulators, uh, just from scratch, to do their research. And that's not, I honestly, that's my fault. Uh, like, why is my tool not well known enough or good enough for people to just use it like anything else? So we are, we've got this goal, uh, kind of, uh, that we promised our funders that, you know, we would get that. Uh, we want to get those numbers up. We want to get less people rolling their own, more productivity, this tool more useful, more widely used. Finally, industry. I like to kind of pretend this is a question mark because we don't really know exactly. We don't track users in industrial. Users seldom make themselves known. I get kind of random emails from like weird foundries in Taiwan sometimes. Like, and then I look them up and like worth a billion dollars. And there's like, how do you do this in Gen 5? And it's kind of surreal. Like, I'm just in this like broom, broom closet in UC Davis, and they're asking me how, how to get their tool working. And it just they come out of nowhere. But the ones we definitely know for sure, we know because they're very active and they're happy to make themselves known, as Google definitely uses it. If you've got a Pixel phone or whatever they're selling now, they will design most of their stuff using Gen 5 at some level in, the, in development. We know that, they're open about that. Google has given us quite a lot of money in the past and let's use their systems. They're a very good partner. Almost anything in Gen 5, which is ARM related, has been contributed by ARM. Uh, so ARM is a big user of it as well. Uh, and AMD uh, is continually partnering with us to do research projects, uh, particularly with GPUs and things like this. So there's the ones we definitely know. I can name probably a few others, but those are the big hitters. Um, yeah, so it's widely used. And uh, we've had people in our lab learn how to use Gen 5 and kind of get picked up by these uh, organizations to go use Gen 5 in their work. So, thing. So, uh, let's hit the ground. So my strategy with this is I hit the ground running and make you go through an example without really even explaining what's going on. And then we go. Then I go, go back. And then I go backwards and tell you what you did. Don't worry. It'll all be as clear as muck in about 10 minutes. But the first thing is. Uh, how you get Gen 5 and how you build it. Right. Disclaimer, this next, I think, this next slide. Yeah, getting, getting compiling Gen 5 is often the hardest part. I can't emphasize enough how much people struggle. And it's not their fault either. We have a build system that's quite unique. We have, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know how to work Git. And uh, I, yeah, so, but we'll get there. Uh, I say if anything goes wrong, it's going to be in the next five minutes. <laughs> and don't panic. So ignore this, ignore this slide slightly, as in don't do what it says. I'm just telling you how this, is your, this would be your normal flow, but we're not going to do this because we're going to use GitHub code spaces already as a setup for us. But you would simply git clone it for, from our git repo and then go into, the, go into the repository. And by default, the stable branch will be checked out, and that'll be the latest version of Gen 5. There's another branch called develop, where development work happens. When that develop branch is merged into stable, that's a new release of Gen 5. We do that about two or three times a year. Um, yeah, in this tutorial, we're going to use a slightly modified 
uh, version of the GitHub repo, and it's only modified in the sense that I put in some materials there that we're going to use in the thing. But the code is pretty much the same. Actually, it's exactly the same. Uh, so this is the part where I'm going to go. But if you could take note of this URL and just go there on your laptops, and uh, I'll see if I need to figure you move on to the next step. Uh, oh, sorry. I'll put it back up on the screen. Oh, wrong one. Jam5 HPCA 2024 slash Jam5. And. Uh, Jam5 HPCA 24 slash Jam5. I can see the link address. This? It's so small. Oh, you can't see it. Okay. Boop, boop. Yeah. Uh, I'm just. Oh, I'm not Okay, I'm gonna view you. Okay, that's worked fine. Okay, I'm gonna. So when you're on this, I'm gonna go back to my slides now. I assume everyone's on this page, or at least can look at someone else's URL next to them. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, tell me if there's any disaster here because this is the first time trying this exact method. If you can code this code button, and then you can click on the button create code space unstable. Can everyone at least press this button? I believe if you have Visual Studio installed on your laptop, it will give you the option to open it in Visual Studio. I would recommend you do that. I think if you don't have Visual Studio, it will do it all through the web, web, web browser, which is also fine. Anyone, anyone having problems there? Why, why do I not see, why, why don't I see the code space? You need to log in, are you logged in? Oh, are you logged into GitHub? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's any universal problem there. So I'll just say, if one should see something like this, this little screen coming up and it's loading up the environment. Yeah. Uh, it's still, okay, I guess it's just loading. Yeah, it'll take up, it's got to download about, well, no, it's got to set up some stuff in there, virtual machines. So essentially, this is, um, don't worry about the, in case you're not aware, Code Spaces is a, a, a basically an on a, a VM that GitHub spins up, and you kind of remote log into via this terminal. So it's not using up any of your resources. I will say that the per VM they're quite weedy. They're like four cores, like not very much RAM. So, but hopefully nothing we do in this tutorial will take that over the edge. And you're all seeing. Yeah. It'll take a minute to set up properly, but. Now where is that code space to me? Create new? Um, <coughs> uh, create code space unstable. It's the, yeah. There's nothing funny here, it's just the two green buttons. Yeah. Mm, code space, oh no, it's on a different tab. Okay. So don't worry if you, your laptop runs in power or you close your browser, this is all stored. If you go back to that same thing, you can load up your uh, VM again to exactly where you left off. If I have anyone here as an ad, yes? What, what's the timeline of that? Because these keep being stable for like days. It'll be, oh yeah, it'll be days. Uh, yeah, it'll, yeah, it's not like hours. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. If anyone's here as an ed educator, I thoroughly recommend GitHub Code Spaces. It gets over this whole getting everyone set up on their laptop situation or stuff because you can just define the Docker container and then you're good to go. Uh, yeah. Uh, we tried to run a tutorial at some point where I was just like, okay, and now install this dependency and every single time, like, no, it just wasn't happening. Okay, so if you're seeing this screen here and things are loading up, that's good. I'm gonna like quickly do for a lesson. 
Okay, you can all... This is my code spaces. There's one small caveat. So... Oh, let's see if I made this bigger. Oh, come on. Well, double size. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it doesn't allow what I see it. I Okay, so your little VMs you run up, you can compile Gen 5 on it. It'll just take like 45 minutes. I don't want you to sit here wait, waiting for it to compile. So I think if everything worked out, if you open up the terminal, so uh, there's two ways to do it. At the top, I believe, is a terminal where you can do a new terminal. Or there's a button here. I'm sorry this is so small. I don't know how to make this bottom part bigger. But there's a little plus sign. I can see this terminal down the bottom here. And basically, I want you to do two things. Actually, just one thing. Move in the root directory, so forward slash gem5 to opt. Move that to the current gem5 directory, as in slash workspaces slash gem5. And that's a compiled version of gem5. Mm, yeah. I'll quickly check this works. Uh, I I've I don't know how to do it for the terminal. Can you try control plus? Control plus. Uh, on Max is that just command plus? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Genius. Ah, I didn't think that was gonna work. Uh, go through this. So um, basically, I just want you to have a little binary of Jam Five here in your Jam 5 code spaces. I'm going to quickly verify this works, mm -hmm. how the thing is going to do. GS completed. OK, excellent. So when we use this binary to run things, you can use this Jam 5 to OPT binary for now. I pre-compiled it. But in the interests of uh, you getting to know how to do this, I'm going to go back to my slides. Uh, Okay, in the, uh, in the terminal, sorry? Oh. In the terminal, you're gonna do scones, and then this, sometimes I just feel like this is a random stream of words, but build slash all, and that has to be all capitals, A L L slash jam5 dot OPT. And then this, dot, this J flag at the end is uh, the number of threads. I've said mproc here, but uh, also four is fine. So I'll do that back in my... So basically what we're going to do is we're going to compile Jam5 in the background while we do other things, which should be fine. So in your... So just to do... I'll do it here. Yep. Scones build slash all, all capitals. I know this because I type this command like 50 times a day. But when I have to explain it to people, it sounds insane. Uh, so that should work, please work. Yes, and you'll get a, a press enter to continue, press enter to continue. And that's, so. I'll give everyone a minute to kind of catch up. Basically, if you've got the Gen5 binary in workspaces slash Gen5, and you're building Gen5 as well, I'm so happy for you. That's all I want for you. And hopefully these, that will be the we need VMs can take it. If they can't, I'll find a solution. Interests of people, uh, well, who have already done this, want to know what this kind of means. Scones is, uh, well, uh, scones is like one of the many build systems that was made in like the 2000s. It's Python based, and I think we might be the only project in the world that still uses it. Uh, and I do anything to get rid of it, but it's like so embedded now. 
So yes, scones is a build system and uh, like, like Make or CMake or uh, let's say anything better than scones. Uh, and all this is saying is uh, the build directory is literally saying make a directory called builds to put this stuff in. And then the rest gets a bit more complicated. All is our keyword here for compile in all the ISAs, uh, every single one. We want the big binary. If you want it, to, if you're only doing x86 research and you never want to deal with ARM, which is very valid, you're probably only going to work with one ISA, you build slash x86 slash gen5.opt. Gen5 is pretty self explanatory. The .opt is different kind of uh, compilation uh, modes. So there's gen5.debug, which includes all the debug symbols and everything. And there's gen5.fast, which takes longer to compile, but uh, is faster and gets you know, stripped rid of all your certs. It's like the O3 in uh, C++ compilation. I always recommend doing opt because opt has some of the, the most of the debug stuff and uh, still is pretty speedy compared to debug. Uh, it's pretty good if you're just doing development work. Only use .fast if you're really trying to skim seconds off of your simulation time, which sometimes you really have to do. OK, hand up anyone who's not, uh, well, hand up if I can't move forward. No, nope, because we're going to move past building. OK, so let's start with the simulation. Uh, if you, there should be a directory in your term, in your, what you're seeing now called materials, and inside there should be something called O1Basic, and you'll just see the above. It should be just three lines, I believe. And this is where you're going to do your work for this exercise. And don't worry, this exercise is very trivial. We're only importing three things. I try to give you the imports <coughs> because importing, trying to figure out what to import is sometimes a little bit annoying. Okay, we're going to be lazy and use a pre-built board. So in Jam 5, we have this x 6 demo board. Uh, just for anyone who's interested, what it simulates is a single channel, DDR3 of about two gigabytes inside, a four gigabytes, three, uh, sorry, a four core, three gigahertz processor using a timing model. I'll explain more about CPU models later. Uh, and a messy two level cache hierarchy, uh, 32 kilobytes data and instruction. That should be actually cache, not case and one megabyte L2 cache. And we're gonna run in what we call full system mode. I guess all you really need to know now is full system mode is uh, kind of simulating the whole system. It's, it's literally what you think of when you think of simulation. You're simulating the kernel, the, the wider OS, the file system, the hardware, the applications, everything. So it's like Jam 5 is fullest. So the next line, so next line I want you to do after the includes is just board equals x86 demo board. So you're saying, I want this board. I want to use this board. And if anyone, uh, oh yeah, she said it before. If anyone gets lost, there's another directory called materials completed that if you get super lost or you've messed up your script, there's a finished version for most of the stuff in this tutorial. So you can always cheat. Uh, and let's get some software, but let's also be lazy. So this is one of the things that I found very early on in the Gen5 project is, uh, you know, you think configuring your simulated system, like the hardware, is the hardest part. And then you have to make a disk image. And it's strangely hard to make disk images, especially for platforms that you're not currently developing on. So sit down and think of the various ways you'd create like a disk image that has Ubuntu for ARM when you're working on an x86 system and you need to compile all your workloads into it. It's just Trust me, it is a pain. It's doable, of course, but we had a lot of people emailing us saying, hey, do you have a disk image that contains Ubuntu 1804 with Parsec benchmark suite in it for ARM? And eventually we decided to give these away because they're such common problems. Uh, so this set workload function is setting what we call the workload, which I guess for most intents and purposes here, you can think of it as the software that's running in your simulated system. So in this case, we've got this workload called x86 Ubuntu 18.04 boot. And uh, we use this obtain resource function. And obtain resource pings our servers and gets downloads of disk images for us, or what's needed for that workload for us. 
uh, just and it, so actually this actually downloads two things. It downloads the kernel and the wider disk image. And this disk image is set up that upon boot it'll exit it'll exit a simulation. So it's basically good if you just want to simulate uh, OS boot for 1804, which I admit we should probably deprecate because I'm not sure if anyone's still using that. Where do you find these resources? How do I find my own resources? Good question. So last year, some students, OK, there we go. Resources.jam5.org contains and we're still working on it, we're still growing it, but it basically contains a library of all the resources. So this is the x86 Ubuntu 18.04 boot. So if you just go, I'll go back to the end. If you just go to resources.gem5.org, you go to a page like this. And uh, why don't we just, I'll do x86, I want an x86 Ubuntu boot. Mm -hmm. There's a workload, it's for x86, it's version 2. Oh, someone should have said something sooner. <laughs> uh, how do I, oh, okay, I'll do that. Wait, I'll, wait I, I know what I was doing. Let's just stop the slide. Ah, oh. okay. Yeah, so I'll go back and do that again for people who are more visual learners. Uh, on the website, I'd be x86, Ubuntu, boot. And, uh, you know, there's the first one. It's like, oh, cool, that's the one I want. Go here. Has a little description. Has a change log usage example. It's just showing you how you would use it in a script. So if you ever are in a situation where you, uh, we've got all the majorly supported Linux kernels, I think, for x86 and ARM at least. A bunch of disk images. Most, I uh, like stuff like the NAS parallel benchmark suite and things like this. Yes? Just the boot, and then the exit. this one just boots and exits. Yeah, and but but also uh, for example, uh, if you want, uh, are you familiar with uh, gaps? For example, mm. uh, yeah, x86 gaps, and that is a disk image that doesn't exit and boot. What it does is you pass a, you pass what well, benchmark application you want to run, and yeah, mm. so uh, and basically for your purposes here, you can if you wish. Uh, where is it? Uh, sorry, we've changed the design of this since I last looked. Okay, so the key thing here is you want this ID. This is like the ID that links it to the thing in the database. So you can copy there. This has been copied to your clipboard. In this case, you don't want gaps, but you know. So if you want, you can do uh, the uh, x86 boot. Yeah. And this already includes like what this full sim system emulation or uh, event driven or whatnot or um, I don't uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Could you this this also the image also states whether this is a full system. Oh yeah yeah. Well essentially, if you've got a full system uh, with very very few exceptions, if you're running a full system simulation, you're passing a disk image mm -hmm. to it. Uh, Depending on the ISA, you also pass the kernel because they separate these out. And in some cases, you have to pass a boot, boot order. But anyway, uh, yes, if it's a disk image, it's almost certainly full system. And if it's just a binary you're passing as a workload, it's almost certainly SE mode, which we're going to show in a bit. Some people say SE mode is like bare metal, which I have some problems with that analogy. It's not really true. But it is running a binary directly on top of your system. Uh, so yes. Uh, when we reference Gen 5 resources, this is where you look them up. And we are continually improving. This is only, I think this website's only a year old, so we're still working on it, but we like to advertise it when we can. So back to part. So we set our workload. Oh, yeah, and then it's portal. And then so we got our board. And the board, you know, we call it a board because it's actually like a board. It's supposed to be like a motherboard. And uh, we put our software in. You can think of that as plugging your disk in the board. Uh, last thing is the simulator. And the simulator accepts the board as an argument, and then we run it. Run doesn't need to take any parameters. If it doesn't have parameters, it'll just run until the simulation has an excuse to exit. But I'm choosing to put max ticks here because uh, the boot takes a, I think in this case, the boot would take about an hour to complete, and I just want you to be able to simulate something. 
So if you put max underscore text equals, I figured 10 to the power of 8, so that's 10 star star 8. Uh, it'll solve the simulation after that many ticks. Ticks are simulation ticks. Uh, one tick is a, one takes a picosecond, so you often have to go in the, uh, I think that's 10 billion. So, uh, do you have any, let me go ask a question. No, I'm just saying it's not like cycles, right? No, no, no. Different. Different. Oh, yeah, I should say it. I, yeah. Ticks are no cycles. Mm -hmm. Cycles, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of ticks per cycle. Okay. Yeah. Because it's weird if your granularity of your, of your simulation is a cycle or processor because you miss out a lot of stuff. Yep. Uh, you can actually set the tick, you can set the tick in Gen 5 to whatever you want. But I don't think anyone has ever had an excuse for it not to be a picosecond. Um, and that's the default. So we're almost there. Uh, basically, this should be your full file. Uh, basically, uh, well, minus the uh, import statements, it should be four lines long. Give the board, set the workload, load it into simulator, run. OK. Excuse me. You said ticks is the number of clock ticks? No, no, no. No, no. no. Uh, allow me to. Uh, so in. I think I might be said in most simulations you have like the smallest unit of time you can have and we call them ticks mm -hmm. so the simulation uh, with its finest granularity can move forward one tick at a time so it's not the same as cycles in a processor uh, it's uh, you know you're comparing uh, orders of magnitude difference there so yeah the tick is just a unit of time inside the simulation it doesn't have a physical relationship with the physical time, but it's a simulation. Well, it, when you set up your, in, in the code, we set up the frequency of the processor in terms of ticks. Like, you know, you can do the math, right? Uh, but it only has bearing in the sense that one tick is equal to one real world, one simulated unit of time as well. So, um, yeah. So technically, if your simulation goes forward one tick, your simulated system is simulated one picosecond of time. But it's not a, it's not a, it's not a processor cycle. Too much goes on in a cycle for us to do it that way. Yes? So is it like the uh, a tick is the fastest clock? Uh, it's the smallest unit of time you can move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Is it event-based or is it based on more Event. I mean, we're gonna, I'm going to explain the whole model, but yes, it's an event-based simulator. So just sorry for that. Yeah. So, so it doesn't go like a tick, tick, tick every time and then checks all no, the Oh, yeah, yeah right. There. It doesn't go like tick one, tick two, tick three. Mm -hmm. you, will, uh, nor, right. you will schedule something at tick one million. Ah, and, if, yeah, yeah. and it'll have a queue that's sorted by its tick value, and then you'll jump forward to the events. So it's different from... But you're jumping ahead in the syllabus here. You know, you're getting so ahead. Yeah. So it sounds like it's a simulation data in this very low simulation. Yeah, you can think. Of, I think you can think of it that way. I think you're correct. Um, so here is what you'd normally do. You take your compiled binary. But if you remember, we have that one that I made for you early, earlier, gem 5opt just in the workspace slash gem 5 And then you can run your program. And all you do is you pass gem 5 Whenever you run gem 5 you pass in what we call the what we call the configuration script. And that's just what you've made. The configuration script, yes, is based in Python, but it is a configuration. I've heard some people say, which I think actually confuses things, Gem5 is the interpreter for our special language based on Python that defines a system. But I think that is, but yes. So you pass your Python file to Gem5. So I'll do that. I'll go along with you here. Again, open up another terminal. Uh, oh, yeah. You probably get high CPU utilization. I checked that earlier. It never goes bad, at least when I tried. Pardon? Uh, so yeah, I got workspace gem five. So what the hell? Where am I? Um, you moved it to the yeah. You moved it to current directory. Yeah, so dot slash. Your binary is very large. Uh, oh, wait. You moved it up. Uh, I don't know where I am anymore. 
Yeah. I thought the gem file, I thought our working direct, okay. Are you sure you're not supposed to be workspaces, yes. not workspace? At least the mine is called workspace. Oh, that explains so much. <laughs> that explains the bug I was facing earlier with this. <laughs> yeah, gem five. Yeah, so while it's compiling, it might run pretty slow. But, so yes, you should, if you ls, you should do something like this. I do dot slash gem five dot opt materials. Uh, I'm going to do my completed materials because I didn't go along with this. Oh god, this is so. And then zero one. Basic pi. Okay, so one thing interesting here, if you actually see that thing, the first thing it does is it downloads the resources it needs to run the simulation. So you see resource x86 Linux kernel 5.4.49 was not found locally downloading. And then it does the same with the disk image. Uh, this is cached, so it only ever does it once. Um, so that's just for that. A lot of people ask about the warnings you get during here. I would say warnings in Gem 5 are very soft. Uh, you can, yeah, uh, if, yeah, they're mostly just notes, like, you know, well, the warning here is like, warning, the x86 X86 demo board is solely for demonstration purposes. It doesn't represent anything in the real world. That's fine. Uh, excuse me? Yes? We are still building the gen, gen 5. Yes, if you can, yes. Am I supposed to... You can open up a different terminal <laughs> and run this while that's comp compiling. And, uh, I, I yeah. lost the co command. You lost the command? You can start it again. Uh, because you copy the already built. So, so this should run, I think, a few minutes. Oh, yes? Can I tell what command is currently you are executing? Oh, yes. Uh, I'll scroll back up to the top. It is uh, this one here. Uh, I'm using materials completed because I didn't actually do this exercise with you, but it, it should be the one you just do. Uh, .gem5 to opt, and then the script you just made. So that the gem5 is interpreting your configuration, building the simulated system. Yes, I really hate that in Visual Studio. Sometimes you don't save your file, and you go to terminal, and the file isn't what you think. Save your files. Uh, so, okay, cool. So at mine ended. So it just ended at a random tick in the simulation as we intended quite early on. Uh, if you go to this point, congratulations, you just run a Gen 5 simulation. And it's not nothing. You simulated a whole x86 system booting a complex, semi-modern OS. Uh, and yeah, uh, and I'm going to explain more about what that means and how you can extend, expand upon it in the coming slides, I think. If I so, okay, we run the simulation, where's our data? If you run that command, I'll, I'll let people have time to catch up, but if you run the command, you should see an, a directory that's been magically created in your workspace called m5out. If you look in there, that's where gem5 dumps all the output data that, well, it generates. Uh, I'll just go with the first one, the board.pc.com underscore one is the terminal output of the simulated system, which is really handy for lots of various reasons. Um, so I believe you get, given the tick we exited at, it's some very early uh, even BIOS or kernel commands. Um, um, yes? Mine is empty. Yours is empty? Oh, your, your file? Oh, that could, that, okay. When I tried it, it worked, but I will, the um, Gem 5 defends and all the flushing that sometimes, you know, if you run simulations very fast, something's still there. Let's see if I can find, let's see if it worked for me. You know, M5 out, board. Oh, here's mine. Uh, is, your, is your whole M5 out directory empty? No, the, the Just a file? Just a file. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. oh. I, um, if you if you want, check the materials completed version. Uh, I'd be curious to see whether there's a slight difference in those files. Or maybe the, yeah. Could you check? Wait, I'll check. Uh, 
Cheo's completed it. Um, I think it's all. It's, I think it's because of the number of ticks. Oh, different. It's ten to the ten in your example. Oh yeah. So if you put it, if you put ten to the ten, I guess you'll get output. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I should. Yes, I'll note that down to change on these uh, slides. So the dot device, I guess, the console mm -hmm. output. Yes. Just the yeah. console. Uh, this one, yeah. So I'll go through them, and I'll go. I might as well use my slides, but the most important ones there. Some of them are more useful than others. Um, so the one starting with board, uh, just this is not going to concern you in this tutorial. Depending on the system you're simulating, this file can be named different things. All, but there's always a file in there that is a terminal output, and in this case, it's called board.pc.com1 device. Uh, these ones I don't think are very much concern to you, but the ones that start with config, there's one should be one called any and JSON, and they're just uh, basically hard copies of your simulated system in a format. So um, that one's a bit more readable, uh, config.json. So, uh, so everything in the Gen5 defines the simulated system is basically a tree that starts at the root, which is quite a nice way to organize things when you're a computer scientist. Um, so this is starts at the root, which is pretty much the same. You, and then you have a board. In the board, you have a system with various parameters, memory ranges. If you, I've not had to do this very often, and I, uh, so, and hopefully you don't have the same thing, but if you really can't figure out why your simulated system isn't performing well, you can jump into this file and see exactly what the values are for things. Uh, so a good quick example here. You have, you have stuff like, you know, the x86e820 table and what its values are, you know. This file is a beast. But this is exact. Uh, any is just another format which I've never used for anything. Uh, I believe the next slide is, but it's uh, at least it's kind of plain text. You can regret this a bit easier. Um, <coughs> I'm fine. Yes? No, yes, sir. Uh, my question is still running. Yes. In Gen5. Yes. But uh, in this case, can you, can you run the basic .python? Oh, yes. So you should have a binary uh, in your system, gen5.opt. Uh, and yes, you can. It, I mean, it might be a bit slow because you're really harm you're really uh, putting a lot on the VMs, virtual processors, but uh, you can, yes. Do you yeah. have an access to your slides so that once the video is ready, you can catch up with your friends? Uh, sure, I'll try to do that. Do you have a coffee break in the morning? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll remind me during the coffee break, I'll put these, I might as well put the slides on the website and uh, get things going with that. That's what it could be now. 9.30? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. It's still in Zurich. Okay. Okay. Uh, right, this is where the actual interesting stuff is. But it comes with a small uh, annoyance, at least I always find. The file, if you want Jam 5 statistics, is stats.txt. I hate that our stats is just a text file. That you that the best way to look through is to basically control F, but that's the world that we live in right now. I've tried so hard to push for any other file format, but everyone people love grabbing large text files. So if you go into the stats, you know, get sim seconds. That's how many seconds you've simulated inside. Sim ticks. So you can see the difference between ticks and things. The final tick. The frequency, similar frequency. Some of these, honestly, uh, I don't. We have a lot of stats output, so you get things. I'm gonna, you know, get things like uh, the L1 cache controller, L1 replacement rate total. That means something, and it means like you know, I mean, and you can scroll down very, very far. Um, if we have time at the end, I may jump into how to create your own statistics for this, but I have seen people spend a lot of effort uh, implementing statistics are already there. They're just named something funny. Uh, you just have to, it's like, it, you just have to search for it correctly. But yes, so dumping stats is, uh, I want, like, you know, you want to dump the stats for the region of code you're interested in, and we're going to get on to how you can 
just get the statistics for where you're interested in. But for now, this is the total statistics from the beginning of the simulation all the way until it stopped. And just a kind of interesting thing here, uh, 0.01 simulated seconds, 36 seconds host time. Uh, you really are, the time difference here is insane. And I'm gonna get onto that, like that's an uphill battle when you're trying to simulate these systems, is narrow that gap somehow. Okay. Safe to, yes? Uh, can you explain the time scale again? Time scale, okay. In most simulators, uh, we can't have an infinitely small period of time you can move forward. You have to at some point say, this is the smallest amount of time we can ever move forward. Mm -hmm. There's no Zeno's paradox here, right? You can't just half and half and half and get to infinity. So ours is the tick. But really, the tick doesn't mean very much. It's just, an, we just say, the smallest amount you can move forward is one tick, and we're going to define that as a picosecond. As I said, you can change that if you really want, but no one ever really does. Um, and every, everything time-based in Gen 5 from that is actually derived from that tick count. So, uh, can anyone quickly tell me how many picosec picoseconds in a second? Ten. 10, to 10 to 12. So if you move forward 10 to 12 ticks, you can say you've simulated one second, right? Uh, I know it's tempting, because you guys are all computer architects, to think of everything as cycles. <laughs> I've heard that a lot. It's not because it's, you would get very horribly coarse-grained simulations. We need something more fine-grained than that, significantly more fine-grained. So yes, uh, and then when you actually, the way the CPUs are coded, uh, the frequency of the CPU is defined in terms of ticks per sec, like uh, ticks per cycle. Yeah, that's it. Um, I'm going to invent in a, a few more slides. I'm going to explain the event-based simulation. But as uh, you remember, Shai? Shai. Shai. As Shai pointed out, it's not like we're going. Okay, we're at tick one. Nothing to do. Tick two. We have events that you know. When you start Gen five, there'll be events scheduled for say tick one billion and tick two billion, and they're just in a stack or an ordered list, and you just go through these at the point in time. I, I really think it'll become clearer when I explain the event-based simulation. So, what did we do just then, just to recap? Because we did actually quite a lot, really, in terms of simulation. We could a simulation using a pre-built board. It's a demonstration board, yes? How does it relate to host seconds? Uh, because at one tick is a picosecond, therefore, a oh, whole second. No, whole second is just, um, sorry, I was confused there for a minute. Runtime. The runtime of the simulation on your host. Uh, there's two slides coming up, there's nomenclature where I'm going to explain host and simulation. Maybe I should have had that bit earlier. Um, we obtained a workload needed, needed from Gen5 resources infrastructure. We learned how to clone Gen5 and compiled it. Well, still compiling, but we learn how to do it. We check the Gen5 output files. And I got that there twice for some reason. Okay, how does it all work, right? You can look at that file and you go, okay, yes, it's an x86 board. I put a workload in it. But what's actually happening? This is kind of what the questions that have been given to me. Well, Modern systems are very complex, and the design of, and di design of Gen 5 simulations kind of reflects this below the surface. Below the surface is kind of a mess. Not a mess, it's actually quite elegant, but it's complicated. However, just it builds on a relatively simple model. So over the next few slides, I hope it's simple enough for you to understand, but also elegant enough for you to see how it can build complexity. It's one of those nice things, you know? It's like evolution or something. Like a simple idea, but it builds lots of complexity from it. So first, the nomenclature, which I, again, I think I should take, make a note of this earlier. When I say host, it's this, or it's the actual hardware you are running your simulation on. Not the hardware you're simulating, the hardware Gen 5 is running on. If I'm running Gen 5 on my MacBook, the MacBook's the host. If I'm simulating an x86 system, then that's the simulated system, or the guest. I'll keep it, I'll keep it the guest. 
system. Um, so it's native execution, guest, uh, and it's running on top of what you can think of as fake uh, simulated hardware. So uh, I don't really quite know what the point in this uh, graph on the slide is, but your host is the hardware, your hardware has OS and app, and on the top there, one of your applications will be Gem5. Oh, yes, and you have a host and some sort of hypervisor system, or Gem5, and then you can have the guest OS. So in your simulated system, whatever host you're running on, I don't care, you had a guest system that was Ubuntu 1804, right? Host to guest, I think that's really the key to take away from here. Yes, simulator's code is, uh, runs natively and executes the guest code. Uh, so yes, the simulator, the simulated system runs code and you have the guest code. I think honestly all you need to know is when we say host, we mean what Gen5 is running on. When we say guest or simulated system, it's what Gen5 is running. Oh yeah, and simulated, simulated performance, time to run the simulation on host, wall clock time as you perceive it. So that's how well Gem5 is running. If, Gem, if your Gem5 takes 30 seconds to complete, it's simulator's performance is 30 seconds. But the simulated performance is the time predicted by the simulator for the thing you're simulating. So remember in stats, we had like 0 0.001 seconds, yes, 34 seconds. The smaller one was the simulated performance and the larger number was the simulator's performance. Okay, people do is, yeah. I, I like the recursive nature of what we do. We are simulating systems on top of systems. You can, sim you can run Gen5 inside your simulated system and simulate another system. <laughs> I want, if you want, like, like nested simulation. Oh, you can do as much as you want. It's just like you got to remember, uh, you're a hundred k like slowdown each time. So it's exponential slowdown. Like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, how how long does it take to uh, take the simulation for Linux booting using Gen five? Well, that entirely depends on how you set your simulated system. It can go anywhere from like twenty minutes to set like a day. But it depends how fine-grained and uh, high fidelity you're going to have your simulation. We're, we'll get onto that. I'm totally going to have a whole like two hours talking about how you can uh, vary your fidelity of your simulation vs how long it takes to run. Uh, but I just say for anything, you really, if you're looking at something fine-grained and want good data, I would say uh, 100k slowdown is pretty, pretty standard. So yeah, we have people cry to us that why does it take seven weeks to run spec? And it's like, it just does, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Of course, we're talking with simulators, so we have to hypothesize the scenario that we might be inside a Gen 5 simulation, simulating Gen 5. Uh, I think that might be on be. So, discrete event simulators. I realized when I started working on Gen 5 that apparently a lot of people studied this in undergraduate computer science, but I never did. I was kind of naive to this when I first started in this project. But they're quite fun things and they make a lot of sense, especially for simulating systems like this, like mechanical systems and systems where things happen. They call event-based simulators for a reason. They're systems where just things will happen. A read will be put on to an address. That is an event. A register will be written to. That is an event. You know, these are all events inside Gem5. We have the event queue, and the most, the smallest number, uh, the no most, but it's really, yeah. Well, well, the event queue is ordered by uh, time, so the lowest tick first. So in this, we've got tick 10, and the next one's tick 11, tick 20, 20 50, 20, uh, tick 50, tick 52. In reality, this is an absurdly small amount of time. Um, but there's the event queue, and the uh, most recent one is popped, and it's executed. So the event will contain a function that should be called when that event is dequeued and run. So you can think a uh, very naive uh, way. Event scheduled into the future is 
a read from your uh, disk. And the uh, time you schedule that in the future is just your latency. And then when you run, when you execute that event, it's just returning the data for you. And events can schedule other events. That's how you get this chain effect. Because I think you know, if you return a memory location, there's probably other events that go along with that. And yeah, more events are queued. And I think this goes around one more time. Multiple events can have the same pick? Well, it's very rare given how fine-grained it is. Uh, it, the, the rule in Gen 5 is if two share the same tick, the first one that was scheduled goes first. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, that's just like almost like a race condition in the real world. It's just, uh, yeah. Uh, some, some, I feel like whenever I teach this, someone always asks, can you schedule something in the past? And no, it just, you get an error. <laughs> but I like the thought. So yeah, you can, uh, this, this is like worth noting that obviously you can you schedule things in the middle, you know, like you, that's just the way the world works. That's the way this works. So this diagram, I kind of, what am I doing? Yeah, so time, this is how it works. You fetch the first instruction, or I think it should really should be a event here. Oh no, because this is a, yeah, yeah, this is making a cache. And the next, so when we fetch the first instruction, that's an event, and that event triggers another event in the future, which is send the request to the cache. And we send that in the future to an L1 tag latency, which is just in a configuration file some, somewhere. We'll say this is like one nanosecond or something, or whatever you want it to be. It can be 10 minutes, doesn't matter. It'll schedule 10 minutes in the future. We just sort of give sensible values. And that happens, and you see, oh, that's, it's a miss. So miss L1, send to DRAM, schedule another event in the future, the DRAM latency. Uh, put in root q, and you kind of see the back and forth here. Each stage is processing, deciding what it needs to schedule in the future. So if you kind of, um, I think here is the most interesting one, like in terms of like understanding it, you know, you're sending requests to the cache. The cache event is scheduled. The cache event therefore processes the current state of the cache and decides, okay, what am I going to do? Was it a miss or not? It's a miss, okay, if it's a miss, then, I, then I've got to you know, do the DRAM latency thing, or get DRAM, get information from DRAM, and then that's the latency in the future. This continues on like this forever. Of course, if you actually graph all the events in Gen 5, it would be incredibly messy, like there's lots of stuff going on at once. But if you just model one kind of single thread of thought, it makes a lot of sense. And then the cache uh, receives the data, and then it push, uh, processor decodes the instruction, that'll be another event, and processor executes the instruction, that'll be another event. Um, that's discrete event simulation in a nutshell. I feel like people had questions about ticks and events, so is there anyone got any questions right now that could, is, that, is anyone confused? Mm, skeptical, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah? So when you talk about the race condition, how do the uh, real processors handle that race condition? Uh, well, it's a I, race condition is more of a metaphor. It's if you if you happen to schedule two events at the same time, like take fifty, uh, just the way Gen Five logics out to stop. I guess I don't know how else you do it. You we would just execute the first one that was scheduled. It's like a race condition, but it, yeah, it's not simulating a race condition. If you know, well, I guess it might in some cases, but yes, it's uh, uh, it doesn't normally matter. Uh, we've, I don't think I ever found a case. And you got to remember, you're talking, you, you, people second is so small, there's so much fine ground, fine ground out there. I d like, figure out how many events you need scheduled across even two seconds of people second time to have two that are in the same thing. Like the statistic, the, it's called the, the birthday party problem or something. Like, what's the chance that two things could be at the same time? It's small. But yeah, in that case, thing, I've never seen that cause a bug, and I don't think. Says it's, the chances are bigger yeah, twenty-five <laughs> to two people okay. in this room okay. have the same birthday. Okay, okay. don't ruin this for me. Okay, it's <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'll interrupt. It happens all the time because of the birthday paradox, <laughs> but it doesn't affect the simulation because these events don't interfere with each other and things are allowed to happen at roughly the same time. Um, okay, this is a slide I. I 
is, I've quite explained quite time. Time needs a unit. In Jam 5, it calls a tick. It shouldn't, this, I don't know if we, I, we could have called it anything else. Like, but tick, I think, just confuses people because tick is ov an overloaded term. Uh, seconds, uh, this is a global rate, global simulation tick rate. As I said, that's one uh, equal second. Is everyone understanding ticks? Cool. So how do you schedule these events? I like to think the, um, know, the atoms or the like smallest functional unit in Gen 5 is the sim object, the simulation object. And uh, well, some are, and they're just models of basically anything you want them to be. They have, they are triggered by events and they will execute their code based on events, and they can schedule events. They can also talk to other sim objects. We're going to build our own sim object later in the tutorial, but uh, that's essentially, uh, yeah, I think that's a, a decent enough summary. So an example of a sim object can be as complex as uh, an entire CPU, entire CPU model, and it can be as simple as like a, uh, like, I can't even think, like a crossbar or like a register. It can be as small as you want. It just depends how you want to set up your simulation. Jam 5, you can think of Jam 5 as coming with more of a library of sim objects that we think are pretty decent for doing simulated systems. So we have things like caches and uh, yeah, uh, all the CPU models, memory systems, things like this. But it's just anything. So, yeah. Uh, and I like to think of Gen 5 behind all the scenes. It's basically a group of sim objects, and they're all responding to events, kicking off events and other sim objects, it's almost like a web. <coughs> so, uh, a very naive uh, example would be the CPU. I'm going to imagine there's no cache in this system. The CPU sim object is sending events to the memory sim object and they're kind of talking to each other back and forth forever. And of course, there's a lot of, much more complexity behind that. That's great, but if you work on that model, it takes a lot to get things done. If you have to connect every single cache to every single cache, every single line, every single connection to one another, your Gen 5 configuration file turns Huge. Uh, I've seen people do this, where they literally connect every sim object to every sim object because they want to be sure they're connecting everything up correctly. And it's like hundreds of lines to get even those basic simulation. And if you do one typo in one of these lines, you take like three days debugging it because the errors will not be helpful. The error will literally be your simulated system doesn't run the way you thought it was going to run. Uh, so. Um, we like to tout this because I don't think enough people are really using it, uh, is what we call the standard library. And we call this, okay, I want to just call the Jam 5 library because it's not a standard, but there was politics there. We call it the Jam 5 standard library, and all I mean by that is it's like your Python standard library, your C++ standard library, right, for all programming languages. It's to stop you reinventing the wheel. It's to give you a set of components that are pretty commonly used and you can plug into your systems, you know, uh, we'll save you writing hundreds of lines of Python file, Python code to connect sim objects together via these components. So a good example would be, we have a suite of what we call processor uh, components, and they're just bundles of cores connected up in a logical <coughs> way, and they have an API that connects to the cache hierarchy system and the memory system. Because if you don't do that, so for instance, with a standard library, you can up your processor count from one to two to three to four by just changing a number. If you're just doing this at the sim object level, you have to go in, you have to add another sim object, you have to connect to the labs totally differently. You know, we try to take that logic away. And what you were using there with the demo board was the standard library at a very high level. Like literally we had a whole system that was abstracted away from you, and all you could do was plug in a workload. And we're going to go a little bit deeper into that. Um, we like to think it has an architecture. Uh, the meta, so when I started coding this, I said, uh, I don't know, like, I used, 
I don't know, it might be hard to tell, but I used to be really nerdy when I was younger. And I used to like building my own computer systems. I know like you would get the motherboard and then you'd have like these sockets and you'd have to put in your RAM and you know, you get the best one and there's little bragging rights with your friends about who had the most powerful system. That's the Sternified Standard Library. Uh, the, uh, I'm a, I'll, go, I'll go into this a bit more, but uh, core you have a board and the board has all APIs that you need to define. And you define the APIs by plugging in other components. So there's like, hey, I expect a processor here, give me a processor. And we've got a suite of processors you can choose from to put it in. Hey, I need a memory system. Okay, plug it in. Hey, I need a cache hierarchy. We're working on a GP. We're work Our ambition soon is to have a PCI slot, and then we can have PCI components we can plug in. But then I kind of got a bit scared when I looked at the specification for PCI, and I realized coding that's going to take me like uh, maybe until the end of, my, end of my days. But we're working on that sort of level thing. We think. Gen 5, when, for a lot of problems, should be like going into a computer store and putting stuff in. And the, where this goes into research is, standard library should provide 95% of what you want to simulate. Because chances are your research is, oh, I'm just doing this twee little thing with the cache hierarchy system, so I only need to modify that component. Everything else can stay within certain bounds. So this is basically the metaphor as said, so typical board will have a memory, processor, and cache hierarchy. And you can pick which one you want. I won't worry with all the examples. You pick, take, take your pick of memory system. Processors are a bit more funny, uh, but we, 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 there will be some examples coming up, but they allow you to specify, you know, I want an eight core system, a four core system, etc. Cache hierarchy, uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of, yeah, you can plug in a cache hierarchy and for the, oh, and for the, we define in the standard library, the cache hierarchy is anything that exists between the processor and main memory because uh, that stuff needs somewhere to go. And so it's not always completely cache hierarchy. There's some other little registers and stuff in there, but uh, I think that it kind of fits. So let's start building using components. Uh, so there should be materials uh, zero two components, and that'll just have. Oh yes. Uh, so a standard library is a collection of sim objects linked together. It's more like. Oh yes, I would say. Uh, it will. It, yes, a, a component will often be at least one sim object, or normally many sim objects, clustered together in a logical way, with a API that makes it easier to handle. So as I said in my example before, if you're just working in sim objects and you up your core count, you have to completely change the way it's connected to the uh, cache hierarchy system. If you're just working, because you know all these data, um, uh, all that data needs to go somewhere from your processors and all these requests. Whereas in this model, there's an API where the, ca the cache component and the processor component fit together. They do a little negotiation and steal stuff. When we built this, people complain, and I think it's a valid complaint in a way. What about, what about if I want to define how a four core system connects to a two level cache hierarchy? Valid. We just set it up in a fairly logical way. And our basic response to that is you can always go back to the way you did it before. The incorporation of standard library components takes nothing away from doing things at the sim object level. You can do things there if you want. It's just we found that, well, we actually found that a lot of people were just passing around configuration scripts that were already pre-built, and then they'd go in and they'd modify a little part they wanted to modify. And it was kind of a nightmare. Oh, it was a nightmare for maintenance for us, but also just like not very good practice because these weren't maintained or tested or anything. So. Uh, Materials, zero two components. You should just have a lot of imports. Again, I'm giving you them for free because uh, don't want to type type them all up. And what we're going to do here is build a system using components. And I'll introduce some other stuff along the way. So our first thing is let's do a cache hierarchy and memory system. So uh, messy two level is a pro uh, cache protocol. Uh, Essentially, you can kind of see from the parameters we're passing to it is, of course, two level. We're setting the L1 data size uh, is associativity, uh, the L1 I size, and through all the way down to uh, number of banks. And you can just type that in, but essentially, this is our way of setting up a, uh, 
two level cost hierarchy system. Yeah. And let's say like other configurations are just derived from this, like MSA charts and stuff like that is derived from I don't know, the size or the. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. If you can, uh, I'll show you the code later. But yeah, that's essentially how it's behind the scenes. Yeah, we try to. We have this debate all the time: is how much should we expose to this level? Because like, is it fair to have the user define every single like configuration? But we do that. Yeah, you, you can, it's all open. Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, and then the memory system, fairly straightforward, uh, single channel DDR3, 1600. I'm going to say three giga, three gigabytes. And uh, I'll give you a moment to type that in. So you kind of see what we're doing. We're getting our components lined up. And like, this is the components we're going to build. And I think, Moodis, Martyr of you in the room could have guessed that, well, if I decide that I want to test a two-level cache hierarchy against a three-level cache hierarchy, I'm literally changing just that part of the program. And yeah, it's a pretty powerful thing. It's Python, so you can have an if statement there and uh, an argument you pass to the file as well. We're going to show that later on as well. Sorry. If you're having trouble reading it, there is a completed version. And you have to, I don't know. No, I just, yeah. I, I, I did think I would have a projector screen, when I, yeah, <laughs> uh, not a television. Uh, I'm really good, yeah. So uh, I'm sympathetic. And yes, I'll put the slides up uh, during our coffee break, because that is a good idea. So you said uh, you want some time to test the new. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't have to do anything. But uh, <laughs> like, I think it's good art. But if you really fall behind, there is a completed version, and it will run. Uh, but you know, uh, if you're someone who learns by doing, uh, you can follow along here. And it gives me time to talk. So, so if I do later, then am I, am I supposed to open up Python? If you skip an exercise here, you are not going to fall behind because I, I will just tell you to use one of the pre-made pre ones. Uh, you can, yeah, don't worry if you have not one, done one of the exercises. So uh, I should uh, run the Python and then Python. Oh, no, um, you can, so I'll show you. That. So here, there's a directory, it should be called materials, uh, and there should be a file called 02 components. And it has all these uh, uh, import statements. And what I'm asking is here, so here, <coughs> is uh, this is going to go here. So that's what I would ask you to input. So just to show you the other side of this, uh, zero 02 components initial is where we want. Go here, and then, yeah, see, set up memory system. So I would just. If I'm being super lazy, I just copy and paste this here. That's literally all I'm asking you to do. I'm just explaining as I'm going what we're doing. Yeah? Uh, just to let you know that the import statement for the method tool of the cache hierarchy is missing in the components. No, no. okay. Uh, it's there in the initial, so it's fine. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, thank you, because I would have torn my hair over that. Uh, we'll, I'll tell people how to fix that in a bit, but we'll go through the rest of the exercise. Um, actually, it might be good to learn how to actually import things as well. Um, so click. Oh. All right, this is a fun processor. And it's going to, uh, I always feel like I don't explain this very well. And it has a, it's called a simple switchable processor. And the idea behind this is, and there's slides coming up which will explain what I mean by CPU model later on. But what I mean is, we have CPU models, that is like CPU cores of different fidelity, meaning they simulate, it, uh, they simulate uh, more or less conform to, they're more or less accurate in correspondence to real world processors. And the more accurate ones, like a good example is O3 CPU, which is <coughs> out of order CPU, it takes forever to simulate anything, because out of Sim uh, simulating out of order operations is difficult. Timing, on the other hand, is faster. I will explain what timing means, but just take my word for it. It's not out of order. It's a more simple processor. It will run faster. So logic behind the simple switchable processor is, why don't we just run on the low fidelity CPU for the stuff we don't care about, and then we press a button and switch the cores out 
for the ones we do care about. They're both processing the ISA. They're both executing the instructions. It's just one is incredibly simple and basic. I believe the timing is, timing is like one instruction per cycle. That's like the model it works on. Uh, so all you need to hear is with the simple switchable, switching pro switchable processor, uh, later on in the simulation, we can call processor.switch, and I'll swap these cores out. And you have to go back. No. It's something else. But uh, you can just swap, and you can swap back and forth. I want to say you can swap back and forth as much as you like, but uh, I've not done that in a long time. But yes, normally you just switch out to the detailed one, and you're done with your detailed piece of simulation. And then you're, nor I find normally people have one region of interest, so they normally switch in to the O3 CPU, for example, get the data they want, and done. But they've, they've booted, for example, on the timing CPU. I'll explain the CPU motors more later. All, all you really need to know now is some are high fidelity than others, but they cost more simulation time. So this is a trick. There's many tricks. And we plug all these things into the board. x86 board. Board equals x86 board. First of all, we define the clock frequency. Cause in Gen 5, the clock frequency is defined on the board, the process, not the processor or anywhere else. And then memory and cache hierarchy. That's what the x86 board accepts. You plug them in. Any question about this conceptually or any questions generally? That's fine. Yeah? Does the uh, clock frequency really make much of a difference here, or is it more for the stats? I mean, the clock frequency will define the, the the scheduling of ticks in the processor and other other actually there's other clocked components on the board. But yeah, it's it's a yeah. Um, if you go back to the processor, there's a CPU type and it says a zero three, like what, what Oh that's O three, not zero three. Okay. Oh, okay. Out, out of order processor. Ah, okay. Yeah, sorry. I uh, yeah, it's not O three. Zero not sorry. It is O three, O is in octopus or whatever the natal yeah. natal alphabet is. Oz, yeah. Okay. Um, but during this, sorry for this is a mistake, but during the switching itself, the starting condition of the O3 would be different than when we exit the timing, so we're losing a bit of information. Yeah. Yes. Uh, to get around that, you normally have a warm up yeah. uh, period. Also, same with so there's some tricks later on where we don't use the cache hierarchies for certain components. We just go straight to memory because it's easier to simulate, and similar things are there. It's very common. Uh, when you're thinking about how to set up your experiments to have a warm-up period before you actually get there. Mm. Yeah, because they are, so yeah. So you have the number of cores equals two. Yeah. Could you set up a simulation which is two simulated cores at the same time running like a OMP multiple? Sorry, I thought I knew where that question was going, but then it went off. But what was, <laughs> the, was, the, was the second so half? Could you run like a multi-threaded workload on two simulated cores? Because there you have number of cores equals two, but that's for switching between the two types. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Number of cores means it's a two core system. So it's two cores swapping over two cores. Okay. So your system okay. can be absolutely multi threaded. Okay. Yeah. And so in this example, you'd have two timing cores. Yeah. And then when it switches out, it goes to two yeah. out of all the cores. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's other logic later on, but yeah, when we say num cores, we're talking about the like two core system, four core system. Okay. Uh, I will say, uh, still in Jam 5, there's some, and this isn't a standard library thing, this is like generally how sim objects connect together is like, uh, I believe for uh, O3 CPU, you can only do it in multiples of two, and like things like this. So I often find if your program crashes when it's, in, when it's doing stuff to start, set up the processor, just try toggling the number of cores. I, there is rules to this, but I can never remember what they are. Uh, and when in doubt, just put it back to one, and then work your way up from there. Also, uh, the more cores you have, the more complexity your simulation slightly. So you, that is also a, a factor. Um, but I put two here just to prove that you can you can do two. And yeah. Does Gen Five support SMP simultaneously? Uh, I. Sorry, I'm not a computer architect. I don't really know much about this. Hyperthreading. Hyperthreading. Hyper I, I mean, it. I don't know is my answer to that question. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's done by software. Yeah, that's, that's what I was, if it's done by software, then Gen 5 will support it. 
Yeah. Uh, something that doesn't need to specialize hardware performance. No, it's in TSM settings. Okay. Where it's uh, to register files, you okay. know, that's mm -hmm. interleaved into instructions. I, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. Yes? Isn't that specific to the core implementation? Probably. <laughs> sorry, I just don't know the answer to this question. Uh, yes. Uh, for the record, there's people updating these cores all the time to add certain features and uh, everything else. I don't know what's in them exactly. Uh, so yes, uh, you can probably grab the source code and find it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, understand you correctly. For the switchable processing, for the switchable processing, we have physically, physically different two cores having each its, uh, its own register sets. And yeah. What do you mean by switching? Okay, so when I s mm, there is an agnostic level here where our model, our CPU model, is a little bit more abstracted from like things like the ISA and like uh, other core-based things. So when I say I'm kind of cheating here, I'm maybe sure I named it something different when I made this API, but I say core type, which is just like the model we are using. But when we swap them, uh, there is certain translations that go on. But as far as I'm concerned, like the, a lot of the modeling is um, agnostic to that. It works. Uh, but as you said, there is some, a warm up period is often advisable because they are different. So I'm not explaining that very well. Uh, one thing I should have probably said earlier is uh, all the processors are IS ISA agnostic, first of all. So the type of process, so it's not like you have an x86 O3 uh, CPU. The O3 model is agnostic to the ISA. So uh, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So we have a definition, no? Because uh, I think when you think it through, it takes something like out of order processing, right? You can do that on any ISA, right? So we can plug in our ISA definition, which is in Gen 5, it's huge, it's a beast for like ARM. Well, ARM, x86, RISC-V, and we also theoretically su support Spark and MIPS, but the big three are there. And uh, so when I say CPU ty core type or core model, it's like, how are we processing the ISA? And I believe there's a lot of agnostic levels inside uh, how the registers are set up and stuff as well. So can you like mix and match between the? Uh, okay. Well, you can. You can have two timing cores and two or two, no, two no, or three. No, I mean, like, um, if you said agnostic, so I can, because you still do need to define like what I'm using, right? Oh yeah, yeah. You always have right, to define. So, so this is a. Like, if I just say like four is five core, that one is like this out of order switch or whatever. I can connect that processor to any of the ISAs. Yes. Okay. It's like um, when, when, once we define our core model, we, we've got APIs and stuff where it's like a, like it's like the ISA is like a mix-in. Like, okay, I've got my O3 core. Oh, but we're going to use x86. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's quite nice. So uh, yeah, and he, so here, the third line is what ISA we're going to use. But I could put an ARM RISC-V. Yeah. The only thing I'd have to change would be the workload, because the workload here would be compiled to x86. And the board, right? Oh, yes, the board. Sorry, yes, the board as well. So yeah, it's just the way ISAs are that, for instance, x86 has this crazy like memory range system that we just have to deal with on the board. And also through the legacy reasons, some of the other ISAs have funny little tweaks. So we have different boards for them as well. But uh, we try to keep things as agnostic, agnostic as possible. Um, yeah. Um, some, someone in the project was mad at me because you can't have two different ISAs on the same board. Uh, and he insisted that this was like definitely something that he wanted to have. But I was not coding that. I was not having ARM and RISC-V and x 6 all available on one board somehow. Madness. Uh, uh, and then, uh, yeah, I think add, the, add them to the board. It's, sorry, am I going too fast, too far ahead for anyone? Okay. Okay, this is a funny workload, but uh, at first glance, 
Uh, it's better if you focus on the bottom half first. I ignore the command part. So we want to do a full system simulation. Remember earlier I said, basically, you're doing a full system simulation, you need a disk image. And for x86, you also need the kernel. We keep them separate. Uh, and we're going to use Jaren5 resources again. So we obtain vSource, and then this string here, x86 Linux kernel 4.4.18.6. Uh, 18 and we're going to do the similar thing with the disk image. And this is x86 run to 18.04. So actually, that's the two mandatory arguments for this uh, function. This is actually optional. So you could have a program like this, and it would, it would run just fine. I think in this case, it would boot the OS and then just stall forever, because it's got nothing to do. Uh, but you know, you won't be able to, you know, you don't want to just like a switch in your simulated system watch it run, you do want to interact with it. And we have various ways in Gen 5 to interact with simulation, which is what we're getting onto. So uh, in, this, in this setup, we have something called read file contents. And I want to explain to you why it's called read file contents, but essentially this is us passing uh, a bash script to the simulated system to run after it's booted. command. And this is a command we're going to run. Uh, M5 exit. M5 exit is a special command we have put inside that disk image which will exit the simulation loop and return us back to the configuration file. I've got a diagram coming up that will help explain this a little bit better. So when you think about it, how does a simulated system communicate with the simulator? And we do this through a variety of hacks. One of them is special ISA instructions that we create. And then when Gen5 detects that ISA instruction is being executed, we exit. Another one is special addresses or registers. And I think there is another way to do it as well. But that's the main two ways we do it. But yeah, so if we execute this command, it'll exit simulation. When we go back into the simulated system, it'll you can imagine when we exit, it's like everything is frozen. When we go back in, it'll immediately start executing from where it laid off. The event queue is the same, it'll just start executing. So immediately once you get back in simulation, the next thing it's going to do is echo, this is running all three CPUs. Sleep for one second, then M5 exit again. Okay, so important things to take away here. You're setting your workload here, kernel, disk image, and then you're passing a command to run when that system's booted. M5 exit will exit the simulation loop. When we go back in, we'll run these two very basic bash commands here and exit again. I hope Michael might. Oh, yes, the next slide is very helpful. So, this is a double diagram and also something you want to do. So, your next one to four lines in your file are going to be simulator forward and simulator run, processor.switch, simulator run. And this is what you're defining here. Simulator, you're setting up the simulator with the board. The moment the Gen5 interprets simulator.run, we jump into the simulated system when we start the event queue, we start a simulation loop. When I say simulation loop, I just mean the loop that goes through the event queue, the simulated system. In this case, first thing it's going to do is boot the OS. And then it's going to read file contents as executed. That's just the way this disk is set up. And that gets us to the first M5 exit event. What that does is Gen5 says, oh, someone's exiting the simulation loop. Cool, back. We're right back here. We're right back after this run statement. And we'll execute the next thing. Processor.switch. So we're switching out the timing cores, which are slightly faster, for the O3's cores, which are slightly, well, much more costly. Similarly, run again, run our, F, run our little print statement, sleep for one second, second M5 exit, and then we go back here, and if we reach the end of the configuration file, it's just end of execution. Uh, anyone having trouble with that in any way? So, when you do the M5 exit automatically, it's like a VM, it right? goes to the hypervisor or the simulator or whatnot. Yeah. And then any other command that you, like how do you define where to switch? Like in, in the example, 
that you had. What, what do you mean by switching? Uh, the sw uh, process of the switch? Yeah, so this is this is the time when it switches. Right, but in, but in the previous slide, what the actual example or? or uh, uh, there's nothing, we don't switch. switch. There is no switch here, okay. Yeah, okay. this well, is, the same example, I mean, sorry. It's, I mean, we can look at this, like, now that we understand, like, when this exits, mm -hmm. in our, we're exiting to after that first run statement, and then we're switching out, and then we go back in, and we start here. That's why I'm saying this is running an O3 CPU. Right, but when you specify you are. the switch command, that, um, you don't specify it here, below here, ah, you are, so you okay. would have these four statements. So you need to synchronize the exits with what you want to do on the side of the simulator. So I can yes. exit switch, exit switch, exit switch. Uh, I guess sim yes, synchronize is kind of right. Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. Like you have, uh, if you want your first exit to then have this, then yes, after your first run, you have to go. Sim We've got a fancier thing coming up where you can manage this better. But naively, if you just got ex like three exits, you would have three runs. And then you do whatever you want between. Or next, an argument and jump to a specific function, I guess. Something. Uh, we we yeah we have it's not really um, we have different e we um, uh, for the record we have the M five exit is the most vanilla exit type. Mm -hmm. We have other exit types, for instance, dump stats, which returns says this in there. Hey, dump stats, which means uh, you know print the stats output and refer everything to zero, uh, and then uh, other va other various things. Uh, even if actually you're running a Gen 5 simulation and you control C, that actually is, uh, Gen 5 interprets that as a, what we call an exit event, exit simulation loop. Except it will, I think that's special in case it won't run the rest of the script. But yes, it will do that. So, yeah, all I'm asking is these four lines here, which seem a bit redundant, but that is, so, just, I'll go, I want, uh, Someone told me that we had a bad import. Uh, so, uh, here. So, I wouldn't worry too much about this because uh, we're going to move on to different things soon enough. But if you want this script to actually work, if you go into materials completed and go to the completed example and copy and paste this import statement, yeah into your, because uh, this is wrong, or it's not there. Yeah, it's just not there. Just copy and paste that. <coughs> but I'll say, if you want to find out where these components are, if you want to figure out this yourself, uh, all the Gen5 standard library components are under source. Well, first of all, everything compiled in Gen5 is under source. So that's a good place to start. Python. Gem 5. Mm. Gee, he's going at snail space. And uh, components, pre built, resources, simulate. So, components here your boards, cache hierarchies, memories, processors. Who I want cache hierarchies? Uh, it's going to be a Ruby cache hierarchy. And then a uh, messy, where's messy 2 level? Like, cool. So, I want to import this file. And import this file, it will be gem 5. Doc, so, it starts from here. So gem 5componentscacharchiesruby the thing. I need to clean up the way these imports are done. I just learned to program using Java, and this is how you had these giant import mm -hmm. statements that just went on forever. Uh, but yes. Uh, so I think it might be helpful at this stage to go to the full, exam the full example I had, just to make sure everyone's got the right code in front of them. So I could, you can, if you want, run this, but it's a simulation boot and it'll take you a while to get to the uh, switch statement. Uh, you can run it in your own time. It will do what it says, assuming you haven't made some grave error. Um, where's, let me choose. Okay. So we have our imports, our cache hierarchy setup, memory, pretty simple. A special switching switchable processor, uh, the board, the plugs, we plug in all the components, and then our workload specification. So this is the command to run after boot, and this is just disk image information. And then simulator board run, so runs to the first M5 exit event command, right? Uh, 
And then we switch the processor cores out, run again, uh, and that works. All right. So uh, I think just because this did take a while to run, and we're going to we're, we're going to hack at this and get this faster. So don't worry. But I'll move on to the part because you alluded to this. Isn't this a really we isn't this a really kind of lame way to kind of handle these exits. How do you differentiate between them? How do you manage this realistically? Uh, you can easily have a simulation with, you know, I want to simulate, I want to swap processors all the time. I want to have like five different regions. You know, how do you do this? Well, we have something that's worth thinking, but it involves a little bit of mental power. So bear with me. I always... Uh, I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, is the sleep and echo command Yes, it's a bash. It's a bash script. Yeah, it's executed on the simulated guest system. Because, yeah. because the boot process have, have been completed and the, and the, 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 the yeah. shell. Yeah. So the uh, well, we're going to find ways around this, but the really down, the really, the real kick in the face is uh, you have to simulate the whole OS boot to just run this stupid little bash command, right? And that is just, but we have ways of running this, I'm going to show you various ways. But for now, we're living with this because I haven't educated you up to this point yet. So in terms of handling, again, I'm going to use the term exit events here, exit events. Exit events meaning events triggered inside the guest simulated system that give you back, that communicate back or exit the simulation loop to the Gen 5 simulator. And you, can and you can do things with your system. Very powerful. There is a different way to do this, and it involves something very uncomfortable that a lot of people don't understand, Python generators. Uh, but we can actually do the same thing with this statement here. So know how we had the simulator function before when we defined the board? Well, I'm also going to tell the simulator, I'm going to give feed it in advance what I want it to do in certain exit. So an exit event type exit, I want it to uh, yield a function from a list and do that function. So here I'm saying yield processor.switch and we'll execute it. If it goes in a second time, we have nothing left to yield and it will just exit the simulation entirely. But if I wanted to do something else, I just have another function in this list. That function could be a print statement. Or, well, I guess it could be any function you want, really. So that's how we do it. And the, po the power in this isn't that we can do things via generators, which I admit are slightly confusing. Uh, it's the fact that we can have different exit events. So, and this, the, this is right now a very manual process. So when we create the disk images, we have to like put these in where we want them to be. Uh, but the most vanilla, straightforward one is exit. Another one is, I remember this one's fail. Uh, basically, in, there's been some failure in the system, maybe a kernel panic or something. Uh, if you don't handle this exit event, handling meaning do something here, it will just exit the system. You, we do have a switch CPU exit event, which if, we're, if we really wanted to specialize this disk image, uh, we would use that exit event to signal here. So we'd say, hey, on a switch CPU exit event, switch processor. But this disk image is very naive. Max pick. No one, no one. Our first ever simulation, we set the max pick. That's what it is. It's an exit event max pick. So you could handle this exit event and jump back in if you wanted to. Don't no, just question. Don't we create the switch CPU? Um, we create the switch CPU, but there is an exit event for switch CPU. Maybe all this is is a all this is is an annotation. Right. So all you don't have to do anything when this is right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, but I'm just saying that we switch the CPU already from the simulator, right? We have to oh, work yeah. ourselves. So when actually is going to be an <coughs> exit event for switch CPU within the simulated system? Uh, when, uh, these are annotations you put inside programs that run on your simulated system. <coughs> oh, second so like MD5 exit. <coughs> dot, dot. It's actually an ad, it, in the way, uh, so I showed you the bash script version, which is M5, and then it would be like M5 switch CPU. You can also compile it into C programs, mm. and it's literally just like an annotation you put in your code. Yeah. A very, very common one is work begin and work end. So we uh, which we use to highlight regions of interest in an execution. We say, 
right, work begin, meaning we're at the point in the program where we really want to get detail. We jump out, we clear the stats, because everything before is junk, uh, and then we run, and then when we hit the work end, we uh, output the stats, and we normally just exit execution. Yes? Are these always triggered by the use of, like if I'm writing some program, do I always have to explicitly state that I want an exit, and then mm. exit or fail? Yeah. If you don't, yeah, if you want specifically to exit, you won't get any exit events at all until, well actually, the only exit event that's for sure is max tick, but I mean by default max tick is sent to like 10 years in the future. <laughs> so it will keep executing. So you have to be, I mean, I think wrong with you. you can control C when you get bored of your simulation, but if you want to exit and do stuff, you get stats at certain points, you can, uh, yeah, you have to kind of annotate your workloads. Yeah? One of the events of the risk is checkpoint, and just to implant support checkpoint and risk active the simulation from the snapshot. Oh yeah, I've got a treat for you. There's a whole like half hour in checkpoints. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, we, we, have, we have checkpoints, yeah. Uh, yep. So uh, I just want to make sure I uh, got this correctly. So when you annotate and when you are saying uh, on exit event, uh, mm -hmm. no process is switch. So whenever we have uh, exit in our list of commands, uh, the control will go here, it will do procedure.switch, and then go back to the simulate, uh, list of commands. Uh, okay, I'll talk. This line here is almost like a definition of behavior. And really, the way you read this is on the first exit, exit, on the first exit, exit event, you execute this function. And actually, there's no definition for anything after that. So this will say, if there's no definition, we just exit and we don't do anything. You could have anything there. You could write your own function that, um, like, I don't know, like, does a matrix multiply. It wouldn't make any sense, but you could do it. You go back to your whole system, you'd run whatever you want. If you had, let's say, three exit events, exit, 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 and you want to do one for one and two, you would have <coughs> no, processor real switch, comma, processor real switch. Because you're saying, after the first one and second one, I want this behavior. It really grows in complexity when you have different types. Because you can imagine a work begin and work end. But you might also have a checkpoint. So I'm jumping ahead of it. But checkpoint is like save point, checkpoint. You can save the state of the simulation and revert back to it. So this is normally used for, this is the point in the simulation we want to take a checkpoint. So exit the simulation, you'll take a checkpoint, but you like a save file on your system, and it'll go back into the simulation. But you don't want that to affect your work within work end behavior, because you're still doing stuff. And it's really important to keep in mind, when you jump back into simulation, you're exactly where you left off. Like, everything is safe, and you no loss of information. Yes? I assume that all of these exit event commands work when you're just doing the system, uh, system <coughs> emulation, as opposed to like the full they will, uh, yeah, they work in Cisco, Cisco, Cisco uh, emulation mode as well. I don't, the reason I really don't like showing this slide is I'm currently working on improving this massively because mm -hmm. I don't like how it's, I want, okay, what's coming up, sneak peek, is I don't like how this is annotation based. I want to return more complex information from the simulated system. Uh, I, don't, I never liked how this was just like a flag. And also I didn't like how you know, it was nothing beyond the annotation. You had to define what each annotation did. Okay. So, but, but for now, that's how it works. Yes? Sure, go ahead. So, did you say that you should annotate those uh, uh, exit events in the software, for the software that they will be running yes. on the best machine? So let's say you're running a uh, good, let's say you're running a uh, Parsec benchmark suite. Uh, you've got to first of all boot the whole OS. So you probably want to, uh, Okay, put a checkpoint after the OS, right? So you don't have to do that ever again. Uh, so, you, so when you do your disk image, you'd have to put a script somewhere that when your OS is booted, <coughs> M5 checkpoint is executed. Then inside your Parsec benchmark suite, you'd have to go into the C code, I think it's written in C, and put in your work begin and work exit events where you want them to be. Uh, presumably a beginning and end of uh, Benchmark applications. And the Gen 5 software can catch those CPS. Absolutely, yeah. There's, but if you try to execute that on your whole system, like say a, uh, the Parsec binary with these annotations, I'm not sure exactly what would happen, but as I said, they, uh, they, the, the way Gen 5 knows that the 
uh, guest system is trying to talk to it is it writes to, it executes uh, instructions that don't exist or uh, accesses memory locations that shouldn't exist uh, or registers that aren't part of the simulated system. Um, yeah. Um, I, I know it's break time, right? Uh, so I'll just, yeah, this is a good time to uh, kind of finish off. If you want, uh, yeah, if you want to run your simulation, you can. Uh, it will take a while. Maybe if you're back from the break, it might have finished. I don't know. Um, has, has, has your compilation finished yet? OK, great. Compilation is finished? So, yeah. Oh, that's great, because we, we've got more compilation coming up. So I uh, jump like, no, I mean, like, the first time you can, OK, whatever you do, don't delete your build directory, right? Because we're going to, you know, <laughs> Building it the first time is painful. Building next time should take like 10 minutes. Um, yeah, OK. Um, I'll put up the slides on probably the Gen 5 website. I'll give you the link. Uh, you can spend your break as you wish. We'll as it here. Uh, after break, we're going to move on to how to speed up your execution using checkpoints, different CPU models. Uh, I'll show you KVM mode, which is very nice. Uh, uh, SEMFS <coughs> as well. Uh, did, did everyone get back into code space? Yep, good. It restored as promised. Um, My build failed. Your build failed? What did it fail with? Anything uh, interesting? The, yeah, LD terminated with single, signal 15. Try, try, try rebooting the compilation but use fewer threads. Use like okay. two. I think when you get that, it's normally because the linker run out of memory. Yeah, uh, do you have a question? No, I thought you had your hand up. Um, so you can run what we just did and see it have the exit events and come out. Uh, I'll leave it to your own time. It takes some time. and I'm going to show you how to speed things up, so maybe you want to hold your breath a bit. So what did we just do? In a full system simulation, I'm going to go into more details what full system means in contrast to syscall emulation mode. But you can see now it's full system as in it's simulating the full operating system. Created and handled exit events. Switch CPU fidelity at a chosen point in time. Dump st oh, we didn't actually dump stats. For a record, you could have dumped stats there as well. I was going to demo that. I'm sure that's a notes in my slide. Remember this. Um, simulations so far have been very, very slow. I know this has been a topic that keeps coming up. Uh, as I say, I would say this is a good metric for if you want to get, I mean, it really does vary what you're simulating. If you're simulating something s simple, obviously this isn't the case. But I'd say for, you want decent data for most real world systems, you're talking about 100K slowdown. So you got to be, and it's just the nature of simulations. We're simulating incredibly complex systems. And there's no way your simulator is going to be faster than the simulated thing, right? Or, or as efficient. At least that's the way I think it. Fortunately, there are workarounds. I know some people really hate this, sli hate this slide, and I'm going to tell you why. But I think, as a starting point, trading off fidelity for simulation time is a good way to think about this. Fidelity meaning uh, how accurate it is to a real world uh, system. Um, because you don't really need to simulate everything in your system when you think about it. As I say, we've spent numerous times, you don't just simulate the kernel boot every single time when you're interested in benchmarking applications. Favorite sort of thing is this. You don't need to, and as I'll say, in syscall emulation mode, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, that doesn't simulate the OS. And there's some situations where you don't really need to simulate the OS at all. Uh, it's just not necessary. Um, the reason some people hate a site is a lot of these tricks aren't really fidelity. It can be what you're simulating. So I say, like, I might flippantly say the O3 CPU is higher fidelity than the simple CPU. And someone will say, well, if I'm not simulating an out of a core, it's, it's not lower fidelity. You know what I mean? Like, you can simulate simple systems that will run faster. So it's not always true, but it's a nice way to model it. Uh, so it's more accurately simulation complexity. Simulation can always be made faster by simulating less. This is an XKCD comic where the random number generator just returns four, because why not? And that's honestly kind of hard to enforce. Like, if it, you know, why do we have to simulate this if anything will do? And that's, that's, all, that's base little tricks. And that isn't always a bad thing. A lot of simulation is of no interest to us. So typically it's like this, kernel boot, whatever, wider OS setup, whatever, 
the benchmark loading into memory and setting up its things, whatever, a region of interest, real stuff, and then, well, actually, normally with a CSA execution, we could theoretically clean up and do whatever you want afterwards. And that's very important. And normally, a region of interest is very small. You want to simulate particular behavior. If you're interested in, um, I work with people who are very interested in graphs. So they have a lot of graph benchmarking applications. Like, they just care about those like few seconds where you're traversing all these graphs uh, very high speeds. And everything else to do with the computer system is just no interest to them. And that's how we slice. For the record, we're, we recently got a grant to simulate the next generation of supercomputers. And someone came into the office and was like, I think I found a way to get a thousand fold speed up in Gen 5 to make this work. And then, the, not with any sarcasm, but you'll need to do that about 50 more times for us to be able to simulate this system. So it's like, that's like, we keep having to get it more and more down. Get it like, so, Who's yeah. Who's doing for your HPC work? Uh, mostly uh, the Department of Energy. Yeah. So. So some techniques we, we provide. I'm going to go each of these in detail, but just so you know, like their names, I guess. SE mode, using different CPU models. Okay, we touched on that before. Checkpoints, it's kind of what you think it is. KVM mode, some of you let me know this, some, some of you not, I'll go over it. And sampling, I'm not going to go too much into sampling, but it's well worth going over because I think it's going to be a bigger thing going forward in Gen 5. Right now, it's not very, very important thing. Let's start with it. SE mode, FS mode. So, what we've done, what you may think of as simulating a system is often you'll think of FS mode. So let's start on the, uh, the left-hand side here. You have your whole system, and inside you have this little world, totally self-contained. Your full simulated system. You simulate the hardware, the kernel, the operating system, everything. Nothing is offloaded to the whole system. Uh, most of note here, the application you're running in your simulated system accesses the simulated OS that's on top of the hardware. And the OS is not small. The OS does a lot of stuff and it's, it's a real pain to simulate. So, it's full system. <coughs> Syscall emulation mode is our way of not simulating the OS. And we do that by when, and it's almost always a binary, you put in SE mode. When the binary has a syscall, we divert that to the host OS. Right? So this is a diagram here. We simulate the hardware, yeah. The application's running in memory, yeah. Application has a syscall, oop. There's a lot of annoying translations, so like, you know, this has to work on different OSs with different configurations and stuff, but there's, it works. Uh, we get some added bonus here where we can do things like link to libraries that exist on the whole system, because that's a syscall. So you can kind of access things from, from your host inside the simulated system more easily. Uh, and that's quite powerful. Uh, and yes, you can see where the speed up is here. Speed up is you're just executing the binary that you want. The annoying thing is, I th and I'm going to go over this many times, but I just have so many people come up and say, how do I get this working in SE mode? And they explain the problem they're trying to solve to me, and it's very clear that they need to simulate, simulate the operating system, because the operating system is what they want to simulate. People see this and go, oh, because it does run like amazingly fast compared to uh, full system mode, they see the performance gains, they want it, and they sacrifice their entire data because operating systems are important parts in computer systems, we can't just ignore them. Yeah. So in uh, the SE mode, if I have an application that's running and you know I can emulate, I can dump all the data I want, but on the real system, right, you have a jiffy, like you have ticks of the operating <coughs> system itself that, um, that go to a scheduler and all sorts of stuff that change the if you like that is the cache and flushes the TLD and whatnot, so it just disregards all that type of stuff, or it flushes the everything that needs to be flushed. Uh, good question. I don't think I really, I don't, I would think I really answer to you. I don't know how these are exactly implemented all the time. Uh, yeah, I could look in the code afterwards for you, but I don't think I have a good answer. Yes. How about how about the dependency? So. 
the the host OS has to have all the libraries needed to run the to, to, to support the guest OS running on the same side. It's set up in a virtualized environment, but there's restrictions. You can't have a binary that has privileged execution in the SE mode because that would potentially violate your host. It's complicated. People complain about this all the time. The error you get in Gen 5 is can't execute instruction, privileged instruction. And then they, eat, then they complain to us and like the error's right there. You're not allowed to do this in SE mode. There is security, but uh, sorry, did I answer your question? I'm not sure how I got if the OS the OS being simulated while the OS of all the OS of the if the guest OS for instance Linux eighteen yeah. and if the, the host OS is Linux sixteen. Yeah, that's completely valid in this case. Yeah, because you can have different OSs simulated in different OSs, yes. But in the system emulation mode, mm. in that case because you are relaying the, the, the system oh. APIs in the Linux eighteen mm. To the host OS with but there's no there's no simulated OS here, okay. so there's not an OS simulated so in this. It is directly related to, to the actual host operating system. You can think of it that the operating system in SE mode is your host operating system. So, yeah, it's using your it's using your system syscall. Well, so if you one of the things you can see which I uh, when you run an SE mode simulation, the terminal output of your simulated system is just your terminal because the syscall that's being called is the host syscall. You, as I say, you can access files. You can access shared libraries, which is quite handy if you, that's another handy thing I don't think I've got on my sides. If you've got a binary that has uh, got a lot of dependencies, uh, you can just have these dependencies in your host system and link to them instead of loading them all into the simulated system. Um, but you lose a lot of, a lot of information then. Yes? So. If we are using operating like my host operating systems syscalls, then what are we actually simulating in Gem Five? Because when this if, is are they like the instructions, everything else. So anything that is like anything but the OS. So if you've got a, I'm, I think the example of it coming up is a matrix multiply, right? I think the only syscalls it has, it pretty well, okay, probably, it, I don't exactly know, but like I think in most of syscalls are just outputting to the terminal. So it does all the matrix multiplications inside the simulated system. It moves the memory around, does all those stuff. Need to print out the terminal, syscall goes to the host. Now it would be, if I want to, as I said, if I want to load in a file, that's a syscall. It would almost be like this just stalls while the file is loaded where it needs to go or the syscall is executed, and then continues. But it's like everything, you can think of it as the actual binary, like the actual bare bones. That's why I said earlier, some people incorrectly, you say this is like bare metal. You know, like you are just loading a binary into a uh, embedded system. It's not really, but you are running. The only thing that's being simulated is the execution of the binary, not any wider OS thing stuff. So let's say the application wants to allocate more memory and needs a Cisco like that to inc to increase ammo, the heap or whatnot. Yeah. So it goes to the OS, and then the OS needs to return something, so it goes back to the actual emulator, which changes its memory layout, so the application can continue running. Uh, well, I don't think we need to worry too much about memory when we're just running a single binary inside a simulated system. But I, don't, I know, it's, I, again, I, you're asking me good questions that I don't think I have a really great answer for. Uh, I will say, uh, and I'll, this comes up later on, maintaining the mapping of all uh, syscalls is a nightmare, and a lot of syscalls are just plain not implemented. So if you run syscall emulation mode, and sometimes Gen 5 will just stall halfway through with unimplemented syscall, and your program will crash, and people cry to us, and our basic, our, honestly, our, our answer at this point is, if you want that syscall, implement it yourself. Because you have to translate it, you have to like figure out what it's got to do. Um, and the only other thing people complain about is, is they're annoyed they can't simulate uh, elevated uh, instructions there. But you just can't for security reasons, and logical reasons. So um, I just provided this for you because it, it would be a pain for you to code up. Uh, in materials slash, uh, this is 03, uh, x dash se dash mode. It's very similar to the other scripts you've had, uh, but it uses this simple word. 
I wish I hadn't called it simple board, but it is pretty much the SE board. Uh, and it's simple because I guess it doesn't have to worry about having an OS. Um, let's go through this script line by line. I'll just exit this and just so everyone understands, but you should see that it's fairly straightforward. It's probably been one of those simple things you go through. So, uh, mm, am I in the wrong, I'm in the wrong one. Uh, okay. So we have our range of imports. First thing I want to talk about is, uh, I haven't really came up yet. Maybe some of you have already figured this out. But our configuration script can take arguments, right? So we can change this, change what's being simulated by taking arguments to the configuration script. Like you can take an arguments to a Python script. And this is just the Python arg parse library. So uh, one thing I've introduced here just sneakily, because it's a good place to introduce it, is uh, we have these things called suites in Gem5. They're fairly new, but think of a suite as a benchmark suite, for example. And they just contain a set of workloads you can choose from. So all I'm really doing here up to about line 58 <coughs> is obtaining the suite and giving the user the option via arg pars, which one do they want to run in the simulation. So the thing that I can vary in this simulation is what's being executed. Which, honestly, like I still see people write uh, copy and paste configuration scripts with like small details, like changing a one to a two or two to a three. Just use arg pars for things like this. So uh, yeah, here, we have a script, it requires a benchmark, and the benchmark is obtained from the suite. And then, uh, yeah, oh, we'll get down. then it will load that benchmark further down. This isn't super important, but it's just worth explaining because it's all over the code base. Uh, so right now, you're using the all compilation of Gem5. But know how I said earlier, you can compile Gem5 with just one ISA, for example, x86, just because you don't want to have to compile in stuff you don't need. This code here just inspects the binary that you are executing to make sure you've got everything set up correctly. So this thing, this, I require ARM. If you're using all, you don't need to worry about it. It's just sanity check. We found that people were regularly running uh, x86 binaries on ARM, and you get this, this weird error otherwise. So we put in this all requires. Not much here, but we have this thing called no cache, which basically means there's no cache hierarchy. But you know, so it's kind of like a placeholder. Memory, simple processor. Right. I have KVM here, at least in my thing. And I'll go over that in a bit. But it's in our CPU type. And actually, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to change this to, I think, Atomic for now. So I can talk about KVM later. Uh, but this is, uh, like before, the switching. But it's, a, it's not switching. We're not switching here. This is a very simple processor. We're saying, what CPU type do we want? What ISA do we want and how many cores? So it's pretty basic. Simple board, looks a lot like x86 board. And then we set the workload here. And the workload here is just a binary. Right, I went there quite fast, but I'll show you what it looks like when you uh, run this. So this is SE mode, because we're using the simple board and the simple board sets up SE mode. <coughs> and we're assigning the workload. And I like to use matrix multiply from this suite. But I'll, so if I do, Oh, okay. Is mine still compiling? No. I don't know why it's lagging. Okay. Um, build all gen5 dot opt. And then I'm going to do materials. Yeah, definitely change KVM to uh, atomic or timing, all caps. Because KVM definitely works in your system. I was stupid to leave that in, but I'll explain it later. Pi. And if you just if you do, if you don't provide an argument, it's going to give you a list of all the options. Yep. So it says, hey, you need to choose a benchmark you want to run here or a application. And I think I found that ARM matrix multiply run is like a pretty decent one to prove the point. I pass that there. And they, now we're running in SE mode. I think this runs in about a minute or something. Go away. So I'm going to refer back to my slide to see if I've had any more talking points here. Sweets, I requires, run. OK. 
So, oh yeah, see, it's done. About to collect maybe 15 seconds. And this gave us the sum. And you can see this is the output of the binary here. This is the bi there's, there's printouts in the binary. And this is the sum of some matrix multiplication uh, operation. And the point here is, it didn't take an hour to get to this point. It just run the binary. This syscall, these syscalls are put back to the system here. I feel like I went over that very fast and no one had not, there wasn't that many questions. So before I move on to too many other tricks, does everyone understand SE mode? Because I will go over the pitfalls, but does everyone understand conceptually how it works? Okay. It took me a while when it started actually to really understand SE mode. Uh, but yes, uh, you don't simulate the OS. There's restrictions over here. So what, what kind of syscalls? I think I don't. I couldn't. Talk, I haven't inspected the binary or anything. But definitely, it'll be one of the syscalls be outputting to the terminal, because this is just your system terminal, your host terminal. So that's one thing it's doing. Oh yeah, sure. Um, you can do uh, again, as I say, definitely opening and reading files is supported, uh, and linking to libraries. So that's something you can do. People do that for in instance if they've got like a binary with a very big data it's kind of useful to use that so you don't have to kind of figure out. Also, the way Gen5 is laid out, it's kind of, um, sometimes you need to compile the data into the binary to get it to kind of work correctly. So this kind of sidesteps that, you can actually do it differently. So I'm gonna go back to my slides and have some caveats with SE mode that I just need to drill into people over and over again because people keep making this, these mistakes. Um, S, FS and SE mode, common pitfalls. FS mode takes too long, so I just switched over to SE mode. No problem, right? I say <coughs> modders, I, I say this over, you really need to think about what data you want and what you're simulating. It's like, if you're simulating a database system, then you're not going to want to use SE mode, and it's insane of you. I've had people email me, and I have to reply back, you're not simulating anything. Like, you're, like, you know, you're, they're trying to simulate, like, something that's so OS specific, that like the binary they're actually executing is doing lit almost nothing. And they think they've sped up Gen 5 amazingly. Again, elevated uh, instructions. SE mode just doesn't do that. Too bad. We won't let you access the kernel. You're not allowed. Uh, and again, I've already went on this. I can't run my program in SE mode because the syscall isn't implemented correctly or isn't implemented at all, is normally the case. We'd love to help, but no, we don't have the bandwidth. And uh, this is kind of what I, I say. FS mode is uh, very powerful, even though it's slow. It can do everything functionally that SE mode can do. So I think in terms of engineering, FS mode has to be our first port of call, and SE mode is a luxury. Uh, so I say, oh, you couldn't run your binary in SE mode? Well, you're just going to have to load it into a disk image and run the OS. Sorry. And people do that a lot. But don't worry. We have ways to sidestep the OS that are coming up. Before then, let's go into everyone's favorite CPU models. I'll say this. I don't like. Uh, I have, can I sure. So this, this is called uh, it's the CPU mode. It's uh, intercepting the system call. Mm -hmm. From the program that's running on mm -hmm. the gas machine, yep. is it too much inter intervention? <laughs> what, do, what do you mean? I, it's just it's just literally if there's a syscall being executed on the being executed at that point, it just routes it. It does some translation, but it routes it to the host and gets back whatever the host gets back. So the gen, gen software monitors the so software running <coughs> on the gas machine to see if, if it's a system call. Is it what it's doing? Yeah, yeah. It's just keeping an eye out, essentially. So it's like, oh, it's this call. Cool. Let's translate this. Or if, or if it's not got translation, it returns an error saying, we don't know what this is. Yeah. So I guess the question is more, is are the stats impacted by, by the fact that you are translating the syscall? They're impacted in the sense that when you're, when you're executing a syscall, you're not getting any data. It's like this: the, sis, the simulation almost goes on pause for your host OS to kind of process it, gives you it back. 
So you can create a blank zone in your thing. And you know, I've, I've kind of pooped all over it, but like, yeah, sometimes you just literally only care about the executable. You don't care about the OS at all. And that's fine, in which case, use SC mode as much as you can. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's uh, anything OS related is just a black hole that you get no data from. Yes? So would it take, would, it, would the simulation go on pause in that said tick? I don't know if it's actually a pause. I, yeah, I guess it must be. Yeah, I think. So, so you can say a syscall takes one tick? Yes, I think you can conceptualize that. I think that, that statement's correct. Yes? I just, with what you said about the bare metal, like how is this different from like a semi hosting? Uh. That's beyond my level of expertise. Okay. Yes. I don't like when people call it bare metal because bare metal doesn't mean you've offloaded the OS. It means you normally don't have one. So yeah, I don't. Yes? So let's say if, I, if I'm running an SC mode and there's a syscall, so when that syscall is executed on my machine, mm. my CPU will be doing something. Yes. So in case of gem file, that like the instructions which my CPU will be executing while doing this syscall, Will those instructions be executed by host by my host CPU or? Uh, I mean, yes. I mean, the, yes. I mean, it's yes. The your guest uh, syscall will interact with your host, whatever is passed, whatever syscall is passed. Uh, that's part of the reason we don't allow the elevated instructions is because you can't, you shouldn't, like that's dangerous and there's various other technical reasons. Uh, but yes, it's run on your host. Just think of it as like. You exit the simulation loop to offload this processing task on your host, and then you jump back into the simulation. Yeah? Maybe it's a stupid question, but why, if, if it's important for people for elevated instructions, mm. why isn't it run in a virtual machine, and then you can allow it to do whatever it wants to do? I'm sure it's probably a good answer to that question. Uh, maybe, may, or maybe we just have never got around to doing it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, honestly, SE mode in terms of Gen 5 project is something we maintain, but yeah, it took us a while, for instance, to have uh, proper multi-threading on SE mode because without the OS, it was a pain, and we had this special way of doing it. Now that's supported, so it, it just takes a while, and maybe that's the reason we just never got around to it. Um, yeah. So in some applications, the purpose matters. Uh, Cisco's matters to the performance. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, so for example, some, some applications may invoke NPI APIs. Mm. But in Gen 5, the amount of time needed for the Cisco execution is not included in the simulated time. Am I right? Yes, yes. You, I would say, again, I just, the best way to manage model this, the moment you hit the syscall, it's like Gen 5 just puts its fingers in its ears and shuts its eyes and goes, just let me know when this is all over. And then when it's all over, it gets back into executing the binary. Uh, yeah, I'd say perfectly fine for a lot of applications, but like people simulate OS stuff all the time. OSs are important, so that's just yeah. Anything up there? So let's say when I jump uh, uh, like stop the simulation for executing a syscall, mm. and if that syscall <coughs> leads to some changes in CPU and memory state, mm. those will not be replicated in the uh, well, it depends. So, it de so it depends on the syscall. Depends how it's translated. But you know, like okay. it will, you know, obviously, if you're returning a file from the OS, there's code inside Gem Five that will, um, you know, get that into the load into memory or whatever, whatever that syscall is doing. Uh, but in the, no statistical data will be recorded. Yeah. Okay, and one more question. So, can you tell me an example where uh, sys like SE mode, in SE mode simulation, mm -hmm. uh, you're, no, uh, wait, not like an example where region of interest is SE mode simulation. You mean you have a region of interest that contains that a that you you have a region of interest in an SE mode simulation? Yeah. Why is that? That's uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Why it's not? It's it's the same case, right? Like you're still having a beginning region of interest and end region of interest. My only, the only caveat is if there's any OS interaction in that region of interest, you're not capturing that data or getting any information. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if, if it's all just 
binary execution if it's all just adding and subtracting and like various CPU operations and moving things in and out of the simulated memory, it's fine. Uh, go for it. And if, if you do, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, you will not capture information about the OS because it's not simulated. It's real. You know, as real as operating systems are. Uh, anyone? Because we're about to move on to CPU models. Uh, so, anyone got any SE mode questions here? I think uh, this SE mode is a superset of the semi hosting. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know much about semi hosting. But yeah. Sorry, uh, my background is software engineering. I didn't study computer architecture even undergrad. So, uh, I'm just kind of I'm stuck here. Uh, so I don't, so <coughs> one annoying thing CPU CPU models is we often talk about two different things. I don't think they're very closely related. Just bear with me. Mm -hmm. Memory acts, how do the memory accesses work in Gen 5 and the actual CPU design? I mean, there's more slides on, on time and atomic, but the first thing that you choose your CPU model is how is memory accessed? Uh, timing is kind of like how I explained it to you before. You have an event that schedules in the future, event back, all the flim flam in between. It didn't take someone long to go, well, what about if we don't care about memory accesses and we just take that as a function call? You know, I want this memory, give it to me now, but one action. So you're not actually getting any data, but it's functionally correct, right? Yeah? What about branches and stuff like that that, that are dependent on the data that you? Like you actually get the data, but you don't consider the timing of it, or you just get random data and that's it. Uh, you when the, yeah, there's there's code in there to make sure that also Atomic doesn't really uh, when you do Atomic, there's a lot of components that basically shut shut down because they don't make any sense in Atomic mode. But uh, yeah, Atomic mode is Atomic mode is definitely by definition like a cheat. Like it's like oh, I, I don't care about simulating memory for this region to. It's only getting functional accesses to memory. It's getting it immediately, just speeding this way through. Yes, there's various branching things. I think just might be flat out disabled in Atomic uh, in the process around it's enabled. Um, um, yeah. Um, so you can see how that works. So functional, you know, if you've ever used QMU, that's why QMU is so much faster than Gen 5, is because it doesn't care about, sim about it's not an event, a discrete event simulation, everything's functional, and that makes things very fast because you don't need to have so much processing and so much overhead. Uh, so Atomic, I, I want to say Atomic's maybe like five to ten times faster on some systems, depending on what you're simulating. But I'll go more into features on different sides. But I think all you need to keep in mind here is timing. Timing is simulating the uh, memory accesses. Atomic isn't, right? Again, if you're just speeding over area of code, you don't care about gathering data, Atomic's fine. And we strongly recommend it. But be careful. Yeah. So if you're using Atomic in SE mode, uh, I, you're basically not simulating anything. <laughs> something. Um, well, uh, CPU design, I would say. Uh, there's more than this, and you can see them on the website. If you go into the Genpai website under general documentation, there's a bigger breakdown of the CPU types. But these are the ones I kind of care about. Talked about O3. Uh, so O3 CPU uh, is out of out of, order, out of order model. I will say uh, it's no secret that our out of order model is uh, basically based on a processor that. Um, did I write this down? I can't remember. It's based on a processor from '96. So it's it's like it's uh, and we keep saying someone needs to sit down and make something that is this side of the 21st century, but it is an out of order model in the theoretical sense. Uh, as I said before. That just is a more complex simulation, takes more time, but sometimes you need it, you do it. Also pipeline, um, you all know what pipelining, right? You can pipeline, there's a way to set this up in Gen 5. I'm not gonna go over it, but it is on the website. You can simulate a pipeline ar architecture. That's somewhere in between a very simple processor and O3 in terms of performance. Uh, with the pipeline processor, you need to set up so many variables about how your pipelines work. I just hate demoing it so much. Like it's like 50 lines, and then you French and congratulations, you simulated a pipeline. Simple is simple. Uh, mm. Most it's like uh, most times it's one cycle per instruction, and it's just as simple as you can get. Which uh, you know I said that's 
quote, low fidelity, but I guess it depends if you're simulating a simple processor or you don't care very much about what the processor is doing. You just care about things, what's going on in your cache or other factors. Depends how you lay out your experiment. Could be fine. But you, there's a big size scale. So if you're, if you're in atomic, atomic simple, uh, you're just speeding through because you care, don't care about memory and it's the model for executing your instructions is fairly straightforward. Uh, O3 timing, which is necessary, everything grinds to a halt. I'll go over these again because, and we're going to do some examples, so don't worry, there will be code here to back this up. Uh, atomic, when a memory is accessed, the CPU gets the data instantly and the latency is simply estimated for, for, for stats. I don't even like this last part of the sentence because the estimation is so bad. Anyway, it just like does this little multiplication. It's like, ah, I guess this might have been like a, a second or something. Um, I, everything happens in one function call for the CPU in a single event in the queue. Low fidelity but fast. Only suitable if you don't care about many access data. And I think, uh, sorry, I said it quite fast. Only suitable if you don't care about memory access data, which I kind of think computer architects really like that sort of data. Uh, they like memory access stuff, so it's the speed through parts you don't care about. Sure. Uh, this is for, for the CPU's access to the memory. Yeah. But if we, uh, we care about the device's access to memory, do we have to write the memory access code ourselves? No, uh, and mostly, like basically the, what you define the CPU dictates it for the rest of the system, but we do have a lot of funny things in, cache, in basically caches, uh, where it's atomic mode, and uh, a lot of cases the cache is just plain don't they don't do anything because you're just access to the memory. In fact, very often they don't. So a lot of things change when you move memory mode, but it's just defined in the CPU. It's weird. I don't like it being defined in the CPU. I wish it was like a board level thing that you were defining this at. But for whatever reason, when you pick your CPU, you pick your, also your memory access system. Um, yeah. So the other things change. Lots of things are incompatible. You can't have timing and atomic exist in the same system. Like, you're either, your system is either atomic memory accesses and a lot of components have if statements that change their behavior slightly to accommodate. Um, yeah, and there's still, um, yeah, there's still power to that's not perfect. For, I believe for x86, our access to disk images is still atomic and we don't even have a timing model for it, which is bad. <laughs> um, Simple CPU, a basic in-order CPU model. Due to its rel relative simplicity, it is relatively easy to simulate compared to other CPU models. This is like what you'd code up if like, you were trying to make the most basic CPU possible that was still functional. It's fine. It executes the instructions, does it perfectly. It's just not complex. Uh, there's various parameters you can toggle, and I'm going to go show you, uh, for other models at least, how, like, how you toggle these parameters. But this is how you can conceptualize CPU model. Again, I'm kind of repeating myself, but I think minor CPU is the one we use for pipelining. Pipelining, again, I'm not going to demo that just because you have to specify so many parameters about your pipeline, like the length and how many they are and how they want to interact. And I've never really liked, never really thought it gave much benefit. But if you want to do pipelining, the power is there. So I want you to take the O3 CPU script and run an experiment. I want you to see how the timing differs between CPU timing, which is a simple CPU process with timing memory access model, atomic, which is a simple CPU model with atomic access memory model, and O3, which is a O3 CPU using the timing access model. So you only have to change that one line for simple processor. And leave, I'm not going to show you how to do this. So that's, just, that's just for simple processor that you've sort of abstracted away this distinction. Yeah, we, we really just, yeah, you can get down to a level where you mix and match these wherever you want, but these just kind of made sense. Like, why would you have time, why would you have, uh, uh, like, atomic, well, th or three? It just doesn't really, like, I can't envision the circumstance. Would I want that for, like, cache, or for warming up structures in the CPU? No, uh, I mean, you might as well warm, like, like, if I'm I mean, warming, I don't care about memory access, but I Oh, well, well I guess in my caches. Yeah, you want to warm up your caches as well, right? And yeah. the old caches are just basically non existent anything. So uh, uh, you've got this script, you take in the parameter, remember, I would advise matrix multiply appears to run in a fairly smart time. 
And this is just to get your grips of how much these sim these these changes impact the performance. I would I remember in Unix you can put time before the command and get the execution time, or you can just look at the M5 out for the time as well. Um, this is for. Uh, I'll give it a couple of minutes, or maybe yeah. I'll let you run your own experiment. So for number one, for KVM mode, there is no memory model, right? Or it does make sense. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah, I will get to KVM soon. KVM. I don't want, don't want to muddy the waters of KVM right now. Mm. Uh, yeah, um, and just if you really want to be ambitious, I don't think there's time to do this in this class. You could have a second parameter to your file that is what the CPU type is, if you want to. Uh, and then just write, have like, three, just do this all from the command line. Um, yeah. One of the, yeah, one of the good, and, oh yeah, sure. Do you know if the matrix multiply is using uh, like the SIMD or SVE instructions? I don't know. Uh, we have the source, you can inspect the binary, but beyond that, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think I wrote that matrix multiply. I don't even know. Is it inline ASM with like a, just a naive solution? It's very naive. It's just like a random matrix multiply. Like all the values are hard coded, I think. Okay. Oh, wait, maybe not. I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's very naive. Uh, it's just, uh, it's hard to come up with interesting problems that are all CPU bound that isn't just me writing for loops within for loops within for loops to do random shit. And I think if I say it's a matrix multiply, that sounds like I've done something vaguely clever. Yeah. I had one student who basically just had like a print statement like in a for loop like a million times and that's how she like she was like playing with Gen 5. I was like, okay, I guess that works. Um, Is that source code easily available? Yeah, so uh, I will have a link to this at the end, but we have uh, it's uh, github slash gen5 slash gen5 dash resources. Don't worry, the link will be at the end. We try for every one of our resources to give sources. Uh, I, uh, we're semi good at it. Uh, there's just some people who give us resources and like, can you give us a source? And it's like, yeah, bro, I'll give it to you later. And then it just never quite comes. But yes, definitely matrix multiply the sources up there. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, if you go into the resources.gen5.org, you'll notice a link to the source in some of the resources. I hope they're all they rotted, but they are there. They were there at some point. So oh yeah, I just remember it's timing atomic O3 all capitals. In this, but just because I, I want to spoil it for you, uh, this is what I got when I run this at home. So Atomic was something like 10 seconds. Timing was like, well, I was running this on my MacBook, so it might be a, a bit faster than this VM, but in the order of magnitude here, you're going to take something closer to 50 seconds for timing, and 03, you're getting up to like 110. So it really does make a big difference. Yeah? How, how does uh, the performance in general like, scale across hardware? Is it like very single core, a single thread, or does it parallelize more? When, uh, you, when you're simulating. Oh, uh, so there's restrictions uh, that I told before on like how many cores you can have for certain CPU types. I never quite remember, but uh, it's so I would say actually O3 gets like exponentially worse for how many uh, how many cores you have, uh, whereas other ones go up cool. So no, I don't think it's linear. I think it's worse than linear. You know. So, so you know, I think a word of my question for you. I mean, yeah. the hardware you're simulating this on. So you said you simulated this on your MacBook. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Is are you able to parallelize this at all? Uh, oh, Gen Five. Oh no, that's a question. Mm -hmm. That's a question that comes up like every month for me. It's like, why is this not parallel? And the reason is because it was written from the ground up to be single threaded, and it's kind of too late now to go back. And and there's always there's someone who like every couple of years will think they can do it, and they spend a month trying to have. But I will say this. Uh, if you're, uh, I'm, I know this is a general statement and someone will disagree with me, but I think if you're doing any sort of real computer architecture research, you're running more than one simulation, right? And you can run as many Gen 5 instances as you want. And then as long as you're maxing out your threads in your machine either way, I think in the end, you're kind of getting the same performance. That's my argument. It's, I'm, I'm never ever going to back down from this because I'm never ever going to make Gen 5 multi-threaded. Uh, it's, it's the reason multi-threaded is the way that event, like the event uh, queue is implemented. It's just so single-threaded and it 
links to everywhere in the code base. It's hard. People keep coming up with ideas and they, they never manage to do it. Yeah. And does that apply to no matter how many cores you're simulating? It's like eight cores simulate. Oh, yeah. If you're simulating eight cores, it will be on one thread. Right. If yeah. Yeah. But I thought just, if you run four exper if you've got four threads to use, just run four experiments at once. There. That's just the same as running them back to back on four threads per process. Two times speed up if you run twice the work. It's actually better because you need to worry about memory across threads, you know. So mm. okay. multi processing beats multi threading. Okay. Yeah. It's difficult. <laughs> I make a lot of enemies with that statement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's because people think that Gen 5 could, like, no, I think it's, they, they, if we've had four threads, it run four times as fast, and it's obviously not going to be the case, but, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, uh, has anyone managed to kind of prove some points here? Oh, sorry, I'll get that into so, it. <coughs> this time is the time on the host. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm talking about speeding up the Gen 5 uh, how long Gen 5 takes to execute here? That's, that's something you really care about when you're running experiments. Right. Okay, then for me, uh, timing and O3 are doing the same time, so I'm definitely doing something. Have you, did you remember to save the file? I think I. Okay, let me double check. I mean, yeah, no, I, I, I could also maybe be your VM just like stuttered up and slowed down at some point, but yeah, generally speaking, these are order of magnitude against each other. Okay. Yeah. What does the SIMOX stat relate to? Because when we did the full system simulations, yeah. the, CNX, the simulation instructions, whereas for the system Cisco emulation, it looks like it might just be micro-ops, because they're very similar values. Same instruction. These should be the instructions executed. The one about SIMOX for like Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know how this is calculated. Okay. Exactly. Uh, so, honestly, was, uh, someone asked a question over lunch, and I said, my response to these questions is, I'm not going to look in the source code for you if you want to find out how this is calculated. Or, uh, honestly, and if you just uh, grep the source code for like that word, you'll yeah. find out where that stat's calculated and normally figure it out pretty quickly. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's my, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, as I, I, I scroll through this sometimes, and I just you get some most obscure stuff sometimes, and we're like, well, yeah, like very like tiny little caches with walker tables and how many walks it did, and yeah. Anyway, um, okay. As people proven this, proven this principle of uh, CPU, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I got roughly the same results. Yeah, like okay. by a factor fifty or something. Yeah. So, um, I just but I want that to be a takeaway, right? Be careful. Uh, there's, I think there's two, two, it's a double-edged sword. It's like, this can massively speed up your stuff. Just be careful because you're not simulating much at all, or if anything. Yeah? I think also with regards to the uh, instruction question previously, mm. it looks like they're the same just because one is measuring the amount of like input instructions, the other's me measuring the microbes. And I think since we're simulating ARM, um, it's yeah. probably pretty much a one-to-one -one mm. translation. Mm. If it was mm. x86, it would probably be pretty yeah. different. Uh, I'm going to go with that explanation. <laughs> it makes sense to me, yeah. Uh, a yeah. question uh, yeah. to what you brought up. So Gen5 has its own ISA, or 2086 or R, which means basically we have different implementation of, let's say, add to location of memory, depending on if it's actually 6 or R. So how Gen5 reads, basically, like when you compile for R, is it like we tell Gen5, read it the way that ARM is implemented and convert it to your ISA? Or is we, we, there's, there's no Gen5 ISA. We ha every single ISA instruction has a function in Gen5 that defines how, that defines it. So if I pick a binary, if you pick, if you and then I compile it for ARM on X86 and run it on Gen5, can I claim ARM works better? If the performance no, because ARM would say, oh, we've got much more complex uh, like microarchitecture in our CPUs that aren't emulated in Gen 5. You can possibly prove this. Uh, but they will, but you will be executing, especially the ARM I'm confident in, because they implemented their own ISC into it, so they're going to get it right. That it will be functionally correct. Maybe your statistics aren't going to be correct, but it'll be functionally correct. Yeah. How do you implement uh, instruction logic? 
you know, I was really tempted. I was well, not tempted. I was fearful of maybe having an hour on this at the end about how to implement your own instruction. And if you want, I can point you towards materials to tell you how. It's just that our definition. For, so we, we have this. Uh, we we talked about this over the break. We have this uh, homebrewed uh, ISA uh, specification language that is just a bit difficult, but essentially at the core, and then you have to kind of microbes and all this other stuff. But uh, yeah, there's functions that are mapped to ISA instructions, and sorry, what was it? Yeah, and then you have to modify like four or five different files to implement an instruction. Yeah. So not so much for me to implement them, but like have they all been done by hand or machine generated? Done by hand. Okay, and is that like a full ISA? Uh, we don't do. We obviously don't do some extensions, but I think for all, I think for ARM, RISC V, and x86, uh, it's yeah, it's mostly there. Like, okay, majority. There was one. There, I remember people used to complain we didn't have ABX for a while and things like this, but and we didn't have, as I say, RISC V is continually throwing out stuff at us. But yeah, the core is the core is good. Um, there's still bugs like um, we had a bug in RISC V for a long time where floating point didn't work really correctly, and we eventually figured that out. You know. Uh, but yeah, it's implemented. Okay. Uh, in QEM, yeah. they use technique to convert the uh, part of uh, instructions in the guest machine to host instructions. I, I forgot how, what they call it. Combined yeah. mission, the, the yeah. TCG mode? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, yeah. They do, I believe that you're correct. Yeah. Some binary translation. Uh, yeah. So, what's your, is your question? Why don't we do this here? Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe uh, I haven't really thought it through. First of all, QMU is doing a comp solving a completely different problem. It looks the same on the surface, but it's completely different. They're just emulating other systems. They're not actually gathering meaningful data about these systems. So they're just engineered completely differently. Could we have implemented that in our system? Maybe, but like I don't know how much engineering hours need to go into do these sorts of translations, or whether we can piggyback on it. The answer is I haven't looked into it. Uh, it could be a thing. Uh, okay, I'm going to, you can experiment <coughs> with different, C, uh, different CPU types in your own time and the slides are online if you want to refer back to them. I want to talk briefly here about KVM mode and I think after lunch, over my lunch break, I'll prepare a demo of this because it's well worth seeing. Uh, KVM mode is another CPU type but it uh, works on top of the kernel virtual machine and the nice snazzy line is, I would like to say, is basically you're not really simulating the processor at all, you're just using your host. Which obviously it goes at lightning speed, boots in seconds. Uh, but there's some massive restrictions, uh, mostly in what we can use. Obviously, if you're using your host system, you have to be simulating the same ISA as your host. You have to have XA6 host thing. You have to have KVM enabled on your, on your machine, which is a process. If you're interested in going through, going through this route, there's documentation here using KVM. It's, uh, we technically support KVM for x86 and ARM, though I will say the ARM is a bit finicky and it's definitely more mature on x86. Uh, yeah, and like one of the things is like you can't get it working in code spaces because code spaces, at least the last time I checked, didn't have this enable you couldn't enable this to any way or any magic. But so this is though I said like atomics not simulating much. S, uh, blah, blah. This is just like simulating almost nothing. Uh, I'll simulate interactions with memory, I guess, you know. But it is literally just using the kernel virtual machine to simulate processing. Uh, so it goes very fast. So ideally, if you really want to speed up your simulation, you brush over everything in KVM and then focus in on using detailed models for things you actually care about. Uh, I still think it's magic. I think, mm -hmm. I think, I think virtual machines and I think KVMs and all everything related to that is just incredible. I will demo this after if I can get onto one of our, because I, I can't, uh, this is, it doesn't really work on Apple Silicon uh, as far as I tried. So, but I can probably show a demo if I can SSH into one of my servers back in Davis. But you're talking, you can boot in like a few seconds and then immediately jump into your thing. Obviously, it's just the uh, processor, so you can, the memory's all there, you can immediately switch the processors out. 
uh, give a little time for your cache to warm up, and then you're simulating. Very, very powerful. Uh, I don't think there's anything more I would say. It only, it only runs at Atomic. That's just the way we, yeah. But, and it needs to run, I guess, with uh, either, is it restricted to full system or? Uh... You can use it in SE mode, I think, yeah. But then you really are just simulating nothing. Yeah, because SE mode doesn't make sense for virtualization. That's what Using KVM mode in it, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can. I don't know exactly how it works behind the scenes, but yeah, you can. The big thing for a while, and this is even when I started the project, like there was still a lot of systems that just did not have KVM support. But now I, I see that much more rarely. Uh, you just sometimes need to have the right permissions on your system to do it. Um, I don't think I, I feel like I've got, I feel like there should be more to say. This dominates my life. Like if you can, if if anyone asks me how to speed up Gen Five, I would say if you can do KVM mode, do it. Well, we call it. Some people insist on calling it fast forwarding because it's not really speeding up; it's fast forwarding, but it's very fast. Could you like checkpoint after you fast mm -hmm. forward, and then yep. we'll get to that, I guess. Or Next slide is checkpointing, yeah. So, ideally, yeah. So, is it typically just used for fast forwarding then, or is are there simulations? Where there, I can't think of any meaningful simulation where KVM, because your okay. KVM is also uses atomic memory, mm -hmm. so you're not even sending memory accesses. Uh, the only thing that is being in, being I think really maintained is your memory contains the right information, but I don't know what use that is. You've got no stats there. How can it uh, contain uh, atomic like atomic memory? Access means like a recycle, if I understand. Like uh, it just means no delay. Yeah, it's a function call. Right, but it won't call a function call. I think for every memory access in KVM. I'm pretty sure it does. Okay, I don't. Uh, you can look at the source. Look at the source code. That's good. That's going to be my, dis <laughs> my dismissive statement. I don't know. Yeah. Can I run KVM on Ubuntu or Ubuntu? Or do I have Ubuntu, Ubuntu ideally system, Linux, but Linux systems. Ubuntu Enterprise or just Ubuntu? Uh, I think both. I think both. It's more your hardware that that would be the problem, and whether you have permissions to use KVM on your system. Uh, so if you look in, you look in here, there's like three or four commands you can type into your terminal to see if you can enable this, or whether it is enabled. Uh, it, uh, there's like one or two funny little <coughs> gotchas where you have to set like perf something to a certain value. Don't worry about it, it's all explained. But yes, uh, at some point you'll know whether your system is KVM compatible or not. It's KVM compatible, as long as you're using the same ISA, you can use the KVM CPU. As I say here, you just have two CPU types of KVM. Go, fly. I guess uh, you, should, you should have the same corner button. Not, not just the Ubuntu button. Mm, no, that doesn't matter. I don't think, no. You don't even, no. Uh, as long as it's the same I say, you're good. I and think. I think another thing is maybe mm. if you change the number of cores here, it's actually going to run multi threaded on your machine. Yes. Uh, well, yeah. yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, that, that statement is correct. That's the one case where Gen <laughs> 5 is multi threaded, kind of. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, we're we're improved. Effort. Yeah, so I say, x86, great. Uh, ARM, a little bit finicky, but we are moving forward with ARM and trying to get more mature because we really, it's really good. Now, can you imagine how great it would be if you could just save the state of your machine and return there whenever you want? Oh yeah, sure. So uh, in case of KVM mode, so there's a s section of memory on my host machine, and when you run KVM mode. Uh, all the instructions you go through are actually executed on my host machine, and that section of memory is also on my host machine. And when the when you let's say exit from KVM mode, so that region of memory is copied onto my no no the, the memory is still in the simulated system. Imagine like you're tethering your simulated memory system. I guess it's atomic, so it's really nothing to this. Uh, I I know some people <coughs> gawk at this, but like. You're, you're hijacking your whole system's cores to run this simulated workload. And uh, yeah, but everything else is technically simulated. It's just, it's atomic. And also the CPU is by far the biggest simulation sink. So uh, yeah, that's where you get a big speed up. Like think, think about it. If you look at how an ISA instruction is implemented in Gen 5, it's a function sometimes like seven lines long, if not longer. So that's a lot of processing per instruction, right? 
So like that's a lot of instructions per instruction. Uh, and with KVM, you're basically got one instruction to instruction again. You just save so much time. Then I'm gonna have more KVM stuff before I jump into my favorite thing ever, check pointing. No. I joke it's my favorite thing ever, only but only from a development perspective because people keep breaking it. Like it's very, uh, whenever someone makes a change, whenever, because I'll explain a bit. It's just, it, people break it. Um, so uh, the dream scenario, you fly through with KVM, you get to exactly the point you want in your simulated run, and you take a checkpoint so you don't even need to use KVM anymore. You can just return to that checkpoint. Checkpoint, save point, it's what you think it is. It is saving the state of the system, just, just in a file, and then you load it back up in your simulated system. It is the memory, uh, register information, uh, but you will, but for Ruby caches, your caches will be wiped. Ruby. Ruby. Uh, so there's two types of caches in Gen 5. I didn't really cover in this. Uh, one is a Ruby memory system, which is more complex and allows you to do more things. And there's what we call classic, which is very simple. Uh, that's basically the difference. That's all you really need to know for now. Uh, so uh, if you do do checkpointing with Ruby caches, you do need to warm them up again. Because, yeah. But, uh, the nice thing about checkpointing as well is not only can you restore the state of your system, you can change stuff before you restore. Small cut, I think I put the same. You can't restore to a system with less memory because you've stored the state of the memory, but more is fine. Uh, you can't restore with a different workload. Obviously, that makes no sense. Like, it's got to be the same workload. Uh, Ruby, yeah, Ruby caches are wiped. Ergo, you start from a clean cache and restore. I, I don't know whether this is, like, I'm alienating some people in the room, but it's like a save in a video game, right? You can just return there whenever you want. And it's nice if you, I guess you imagine iteratively going back to change things. When it's a different workload, can't we just checkpoint the system after boot and then restore it every time with a different uh, binary? And I guess uh, that's true. No, because, um, mm, it might, well, I guess it's theoretically possible, but to me that sounds like dangerous. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it's not a feature we enable, same workload, and I don't think there's men. Uh, you're right, maybe that's theoretically possible, but there's definitely no API to allow you to do that. So feel free to have a go. Uh, so, uh, and you can take as many checkpoints as you want, and you, like, you don't, like, no, you can take a checkpoint every 10 ticks if you wanted to. You just end up generating a little uh, thing. Very powerful. Question? Sure. Is it just a Ruby cache? Not, not the system, I don't have cache. The Ruby cache is more of a cache system. So in Gem 5, again, I, I probably should have made a slide on this, but there's two types of cache systems in Gem 5, Ruby, uh, and classic. And classic is simple but easy to understand. Uh, you basically, simple, a simple cache example would be like, you've got two private L1s and one shared L2, and that's basically your definition of your cache system with some sizes thrown in. Ruby, you can do like networks, which are much more complex, and Ruby enables that. But Ruby has this caveat that you, uh, Yes, you, you, it, it doesn't preserve state in checkpointing. And I, I believe the explanation for that is just we haven't implemented that yet. And warming up isn't that costly. I mean, it's not costly enough for a smaller to implement it. Um, it's a small price to pay for how much you get out of checkpointing. Uh, so we're going to start in Gen 5. Um, when is, are we into our lunch break? No, we've got 50 minutes. Cool, plenty of time. Um, so we're gonna start distributing checkpoints with more of our workloads going forward. Basically being like, hey, here's like various interesting points in this workload. I think that'd be pretty good. You have to be careful to make them generic enough that people can put them in. Again, you can change your system between checkpoint loads, but there are the restrictions and we have to be aware of that. So uh, I put this tutorial here. I have to admit, I don't think this is my, uh, this might take a while to get through. I don't know. So saving a checkpoint. What's it look like? Let's go through the file that I've got here. Materials, 04, 01. I think it's still called, so I renamed this something stupid. Uh, 
Oh, I'm missing the wrong one again. Oh no, my network went down. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So, I guess you can delete it already. We try. Damn, I was singing such high praise of code spaces. That's no, not what I. I can probably do this blind, but I'll see. Okay. I think it's. Okay. If I remember correctly. Okay, I'm gonna close this and be able to code spaces from someplace else. Uh. No, oh, I just think my network's down. Oh, there it is. Um, it's mostly a complete file, and I've just left the parts, I think I've just left the parts at the bottom without, yeah. So I'll brush through this as fast as, like, it's a no cache, we've got a 200 megabyte memory, like small, we're gonna use Atomic x86, one core, very simple system, we don't need anything. It's the same thing as before, M5 exit, we switch cores, but like, I don't really care about the, what the workload is, the point is we're gonna skip booting. Mm -hmm. I've got a path here, the reason I've got a path here is we're gonna specify where we save the checkpoint with this path. So if I go, actually, let's show you in the source code. Uh, so the simulator has all sorts of helpful functions. And the simulator is defined in source SRC, Python, M5, simulate, simulator. And I believe right at the bottom here, you can go through this file and see everything's filled. Yeah, you've got this nice little save checkpoint function which allows you to specify a path with your checkpoint derv. Very simple. So, when the simulator exits on the first M5 exit event, we think about the first M5 exit event is pretty much straight after booting. Perfect time to do this. Uh, simulator, and then let's save underscore checkpoint. And we just have the path here, and we've already imported path, didn't we? Oh, I went to the wrong. Oh, I went to the wrong one. Haven't I? Yes. Cool. So uh, simulator. Yeah, um, yeah. That's how you do. So I can call this whatever I want. Uh, I'll just call it checkpoint save. And feel free to use path to put this wherever you want, but I'm sure let's put this somewhere in the current working directory. So we save the checkpoint, and then, you know, we don't want to do anything after that. We've already saved, we've already got the data we want. Uh, I won't bore you with this, uh, but when you run this, this will save a checkpoint. In fact, no, I am going to bore you with this. I'm going to run it, because uh, you yeah, actually do want this eventually. Uh, well, Okay. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> no, not a terminal act like this in a long time. Uh, materials. Uh, so I think, if I'm going to be honest with you guys, I messed up this example a bit. So this example might not work, but can you all just believe it did? Because I think I saved, I think I saved a checkpoint that I was going to use in this demo, and now I'm thinking it might, I might have not saved it correctly. Ah, uh, checkpoint. So you run this, and once this is completed, it's going to save a checkpoint at the end. Right, restoring checkpoints. 04 02 restoring checkpoint in materials. Where we restore the checkpoint? First of all, I'm going to define where my checkpoint <coughs> is. I think I do. I have a checkpoint here. No, I don't have it. So you would put your checkpoint here. But the 
you have to specify again the disk workload and everything. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll, 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 we'll get there. We'll get there. So uh, he like blah here is where you put the checkpoint. Set kernel disk workload and you set a checkpoint there. That's all you need to do. It will immediately jump to that checkpoint location. So you can change the command here technically. Uh. I, again, that seems dangerous. I can't, like, <laughs> may, I guess maybe you could, 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 could get away with it. But if you notice here, I've made some subtle changes to this file. Subtle changes. Uh, first of all, we're not using no cache anymore. We're using a private one uh, cache hierarchy, uh, just a different cache hierarchy. We can swap them out. We've increased the memory size because we can increase it. We just can't decrease it. And yeah, let's jump from uh, our atomic core, I think was the other one, to uh, O3 CPU, because we can. And yeah, you can change a lot. And I think you can all see how this is very powerful. Uh, I feel like I, I feel like I'll expect more questions about checkpointing, but maybe it's just very intuitive to people. Uh, I'll tell you, yeah, checkpointing is something that's very easy to break because if someone redefines how a processor, like a processor register or something, I need to redefine how it's stored in the checkpoint mm -hmm. and that's why it's a pain in my ass. But it, when it's working, it's great. And it does work most of the time. But in the cache hierarchy, you can do whatever you want because it's not safe. Uh, for Ruby. For Ruby. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And to be honest, if you're doing, I don't I think, um, I say this with some has uh, classic caches are a bit too simplistic to really simulate what people want to simulate a lot of the time. They're very basic. But yeah. And if you have a warm up period anyway, it doesn't really matter. Uh, again, you've got the same set kernel disk workload and the checkpoint here, board, run. And this will do, again, when you get your checkpoint yourself, you can see it will just continue from this point on. Really echo, sleep, M5 exit. You've skipped over the whole boot. So you skipped over the first exit? Like well, yeah, you've already done that exit. Ah. You're, yeah, you're right here, kind of like, do, like in your simulation. You've already processed that event, you know? So checkpoint remembers that the process, that's the first event of the command, technically. Or the checkpoint just resumes... The checkpoint the doesn't, exit. the checkpoint isn't an event, it's something on, like, isn't an event, it's something that happens inside your configuration script after. Like, at this point, when we, uh, going back to saving a checkpoint, uh, we exit here, mm. so we run, mm. uh, we exit here, simulation loop is paused, it's frozen, Great, because we don't want it to move anyway. We save it, and then we can restore. So if I had like a few exits before, and the last exit at checkpoint, I still need the first few exits to be on the restore script. I don't think. You oh, well, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, because you'd be changing the workload otherwise, which is changing memory, which is changing what's saved. So uh, I guess at best, I'd say it's undefined behavior, or like, not undefined behavior, difficult to understand behavior, <laughs> or they, like, and there's no, yeah. So that is the thing, like, uh, the moment you change your workload at all, you need to take more checkpoints. And actually, we think about it when you're running benchmark suites, how many different configurations do you have, like, with the, so, but we're, again, we really should get our finger out and do this uh, sooner rather than later, but we keep talking about, well, let's just, get every single checkpoint for spec we can possibly think of doing uh, because everyone runs spec and everyone complains too fast and just let's get to the points we want to do in the program for every ISA. But even that's still quite a lot of checkpoints because people want to assimilate different things. Uh, but the good thing is you can check, take checkpoints if you want. Uh, side note, uh, I'm implementing something in Gen 5 which it's, it's not based on checkpoint but you can accept the same thing as set it up that your simulation will simply save itself every so often. So when your computer shuts down, you can, uh, due to a power outage, you can actually just get back to where you are. Auto save. Auto save, yeah. I think auto save would save me many, many hours of stress. So, yeah. Uh, so let's say you have three exit points in your command. Mm. So at the first exit point, you checkpoint. Okay. Wait, let's do it. So let's let's do this then. So you have three. We got this in here. M five exit, and let's have another one here. M five exit. Okay. Right. So and has this code is currently written. First exit is here. Hmm. Okay. Well. Okay. And then uh, when you restore the checkpoint, 
Well, you're home at Restore. Mm -hmm. So you still take the exit, uh, you still take the checkpoint here. Okay. Okay, cool. And then you, uh, when you restore this checkpoint. Mm -hmm. So we have the, so yeah, we have the same things here. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, this makes this, this works. So you would return. The information saved in the checkpoint is like first line of command. You, uh, it's just saving the state of your memory. So it's really just like freezing all the state of the memory, all the state of the memory in your system. So logically, you do just return to where you were. So you would just come back in here, and then you'd immediately hit exit again. If it's just storing the memory and everything, it's just this technicality. Why do you need to rewrite the command in the disk image and whatnot if you already kind of have it in the checkpoint? Exactly. Wait, sorry. Why do I need? To, why do I need to have this here? No, I'm, I'm, oh. no, I'm, I'm asking if the checkpoint has like everything you need, mm. including the did like the memory image or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Why do you need to? Oh, reload it. Yeah. Uh, like this, yeah. yeah uh, because uh, not all the disk image information stored in the checkpoint. Mm. So uh, it yeah. So I th that's part of the reason and. I think also part of the reason is uh, having these stuff set up is quite hard coded and I don't think there's much option to take them out. But in my, I don't know, I guess, I've, I guess you're asking me these questions that I've not <laughs> gave much thought because I've just always had since day one, same workload, same checkpoint. Maybe there's workarounds for it, I don't know. But I feel like the moment you start fiddling with your workloads, you're fiddling, you're fiddling with the state of the memory somehow and therefore you're ruining your, you're poisoning your work somehow. But what is way around it? Yeah, go for it. Like we, we, we run a workshop every year where people try to tell us crazy stuff they can do with checkpoints and yeah, it's pretty good. One, uh, there's one paper last year that I thought was a really good idea, but it's not been well, it's not, well, it's a nice idea and I team planned it fairly well, but there's been no maintenance on it, which running QMU and taking checkpoints in QMU and then loading them into Gem5, which is very nice. So we had this whole entire translation system uh, uh, I can't remember exactly the ins and outs, but it was pretty interesting. Uh, if you look up the Gen5 website for the workshop last year, you can probably see his paper or poster on that. Uh, okay, so, yes? Sorry, when you said this, but like when you said it saved the memory state, does that include like caches and branch breaks and stuff like that? Or is it, it, uh, it will, uh, branch breaks, yes. Oh, I, but the, but the caches, I know for sure that Ruby caches, which is certain class caches, are wiped. So if you're using Ruby, you have you, know, you have to accept that you're going in with an empty cache. Yeah. The de facto is I'll just warm them up. Okay. Uh, just be extra, yeah. Uh, I don't see any technical reason why we can't fix that in future releases. It just involves uh, being able to extract more data from Ruby and load it back in. And Oh, I guess also the reason is Ruby's so particular that how would if you could you can change your cache hierarchy very easily between checkpoints because it's a totally different setup. But anyway, uh, yeah, uh, you're you're correct. Uh, red registers, uh, everything that's definitely functionally important is stored, obviously, or it wouldn't work. Uh, so I think everything, yeah, everything in CPU 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 models is stored. Right, I believe. So. I think so. Hmm. Again, I'll, I'll pull my look at the code if you really doubt me, and I will believe you if you say the code says that. But yeah, I'm, I didn't have, yes? So, okay, I forgot my question. It's okay, <laughs> it'll come to you, yeah? Just storing pro or like core state specifically, how does that work when you're switching cores, to say for example, for something like a branch predictor? Presumably that would look quite different when I'm switching from say an outer border core to a pipeline one. Yeah, that's very similar. That's very similar to his question earlier on, and I kind of feel a little bit stumped by it. But I think we just have enough agnostic behavior inside our CPU models that you can tra and there's translation over. But I do know that there's certain <sighs> switching from one core to another isn't the same. As switching from core A to B isn't always uh, the same as switching from core B to C. Like there's translations between core types, which makes the switching sometimes quite complicated. Uh, uh, there is translation for sure. I'm not sure what's exactly maintained. But you can't jump architectures. 
You, no, no, you can't do apart characters. Also, the, if you're saving the memory state, then yeah. you would kind of be screwing yourself. Yeah. I mean, maybe you can jump architectures, but the program would just, the system would just crash. Never tried it. Yeah? Right. So the command we specify is part of memory, right? This? Yeah, this is store, uh, yes. So once we restore a checkpoint, if we don't specify a command, it should already have the command from the previous checkpoint. So this one's a bit funny, uh, I'll admit, because this is stored on the host until boot, and then this disk image reads it from the host system using a very special command that's allowed. So I guess in that case, if you stored the checkpoint before that command was loaded, it wouldn't matter. But once it's loaded in, yeah, it would, would probably matter. That you're talking, okay. If it's not in the memory system before you take the check point, okay, then it's fine. Let's but assume the first command is exit. Yeah. And then we have like three more commands after that. Yeah, so this is already in the memory by that point. Mm -hmm. Yes. So once you restore the checkpoint and you don't specify a command, the, co the command from the. So you don't specify anything. So this is just this? Like this delete? It's, it's empty. There's no, no zero. Empty, empty command. Oh, yeah. You just return here and continue the simulation forever. While restoring the checkpoint, yes. Well, you'd restore it literally here, but you've, this is freewheeling now. This is just, going, this is just uh, running the simulation when you've got no exit coming up. That's fine. Uh, you can SSH into the simulation, for example, and no, play around no, no, no. if you want to. Sorry. I think my question is, uh, while setting the checkpoint, we had some command. So are you saying that we have this before the checkpoint, yes. and then after checkpoint we have this? Yes. But I'm pretty sure it's going to be, be in the memory because checkpoint. So it'll still be, uh, I guess I don't know exactly, uh, but I'm, no, it, it's in the memory. Okay. Maybe it'd work <laughs> if it's in the memory. I'm not sure if this is loaded again in any capacity. I'm not sure how behind the scenes, uh, what this is, uh, where is it? This is doing. Whether if you load it again, then you are manipulating the checkpoint, right? Okay, I'm going to bet maybe that'll work, but... I will say it's still technically the same workload because it's still the same instruction. It's just loaded in the memory, not defined in your file. Yes, I mean, I mean the the point is there's no uh, like specifying command after restoring a checkpoint does not make sense because it is already in the memory. I'd say if you deleted this when you're in your restore script and it still worked, hmm. it'd be really hard for someone to interpret what your program was doing. At least this kind of yeah. gives you some documentation that, oh, hey, this is kind of how this was set up. Mm -hmm. But you're it's possibly you're correct in this. You delete all that and you never, you don't exit, right? Like after boot. Yeah, the boot will. So boot you will. will never checkpoint it. Oh, no, he's, I, I, he was saying, what about if you have uh, like this in your save mm -hmm. and then in your, ex in, it, in, your, in your store, you just ah, delete okay. this. And he's saying it's still in the memory. I was like, good point. Mm -hmm. But you don't gain anything from deleting that, I think. And okay, it probably would work. Okay, okay I think I'll, re I'll rephrase my statement. You can't change the state of the memory, right? Definitely. Mm. And a lot of stuff here is about changing the state of memory. If you can find workarounds and not change the state of memory, I guess it's going to work. We do change the memory by making it bigger, for example. It's just that's an easy one. Uh, yeah. Well, just so be just my guess. I think you can do a lot with checkpointing, but. Be careful and remember what it's actually doing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, so, yeah. yeah. So, is there a way? I mean, from from the command you have, you have multiple exit exit events. Then you could have made a checkpoint at any of those. Do you need to document that externally, or um, uh, if you're giving that to someone are you else? Are you saying we we had a checkpoint after every one of these exit events? No. Well, you did the checkpoint this time yeah. after the first yeah. exit. But you could have done it after the third. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we could have had, uh, for instance, uh, saving. We could have had uh, yeah. the run here. Uh, so my, so I think I understand your question. And my thing is, well, when you're showing someone what your simulation is, you give them this file, right? So you say, this is what I use to generate a checkpoint. And okay. I'll see, oh, it's yeah. clearly that. Yeah. Uh, this sh should be uh, to. This should be the definition of your system. I mean, I'm obviously ignoring the libraries it depends upon, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Can you please, uh, it's very confusing. Could you just specify 
the command command and mm -hmm. do the workload. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, you know, kind of doing it in reverse. I'm yeah. sweat. It's just because I th th had the variable up here. I could do, uh, like, I could do this uh, and just put that here, I guess. I just, I d I'm not sure what's functionally correct Python. If we have to, whatever. You could do something like that. My question is, uh, yeah. when does the first command get ex executed? After the simulation oh, yeah. So in this in this case, this disk image is set up specifically that when it's finished booting, it uh, calls a special magic function called read file. Uh, and this, this defines file and it executes it as a bash script, uh, which gives us a lot of power. So in cases where you have a benchmark application in the disk image, this is where we'd say, I can't remember what it is, like parsec run uh, black shoals or something. We define it here. And this is where we pass our parameters. Uh, I shouldn't say this because this is going to hold up, but in, in you can use this to pass a binary at this stage. You, because there's another, this is, there's another file called read file, where you just pass the file and all the contents of the file. And if you have your disk image set up to execute that file, you can pass a binary. It's directly there, which is, uh, can work, yeah. Is there a way, uh, will, will we go over how to SSH into the machine or game? That's really easy. Uh, so if you let, so uh, is it, uh, so I'm not sure if you can, so here, nope, that's debug. So there's some example scripts that are really straightforward. I think we can go, since we, I feel like we're not gonna move on the next topic ah, before lunch. Uh, no, 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 I mean like it's fine. Uh, I felt like I was worried we were going a bit too fast at one point. So <laughs> uh, let's see an example here. So risk is it risk five one two run? Nope, this is uh, risk oh risk five fs. That's it. Um, so this one here takes in a risk five. Uh, disk image, I think that should be definitely better explained, but I think it's busy box. Uh, no, this simulation will never stop. You can access a terminal upon boot using M5 term. So there's a special utility in Gen 5. Don't be scared by it. It's explained there. Util slash term, you type make, you build M5 term. And then uh, when this is finished booting, it'll output a little thing on your terminal here saying available at port blah. And then you just use this and you go in. But that's direct like console access, not like SSH. Is that y our, we, we have this special M5 term that can make the call, uh, but it's quite simple. Uh, so yeah, l look out for the following. System platform terminal, listing for connections on port X, mm -hmm. which there's quite a few commands that are like that actually, uh, like here. On the GDP is for G the G simulated system or for the simulator? Simulated system you can GDB into it. That's not something I use very often, uh, but yes, that it, there is attach it like what you're doing here. Yeah. Oh, sorry? You can attach a GDB. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can attach GDB to that, to that port, yes. Mm. Uh, so yeah, maybe I should have had something in this. It's pretty cool being able to, well, I say SSH in. It's not SSH, it's M5 term. I think it's, uh, where is it? Util. Mm. Okay. I'll move on to the next topic first because I feel like everyone else in the room might have moved on. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, M5 term is quite, yeah, it's just a whole uh, kind of networking socket thing <laughs> that we've got. But it's just a make file, you make it, and then you can use it and SSH into your thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you want to do that here, I would recommend, uh, so you can just do, uh, something like that, uh, which is make sure that when you load, it just literally goes to the bash terminal and then you're ready to go. Um, cool. Uh, so uh, I will leave it to you. You, I think you understand the uh, script for saving a checkpoint and save for restoring a checkpoint. I'll see if there's, uh, we went over that. Yeah, uh, restoring, okay. This is a great, Okay, I know exactly where we're going to stop. It's like three three slides time. If you want to grab and rattle to the, is it is it half twelve or twelve twelve fifty? Twelve fifty, I think. Okay, okay, I can do twenty minutes. It's fine.
So I'm going to talk about sampling, but I'm going to point you towards resources if you're interested. Otherwise, I'll just <coughs> talk about it and answer questions. Because it's quite new to Gem 5, and I wouldn't call it mature, and its applications are quite old. Well, I'll explain the limitations. Uh, sampling, which here I'm talking about a technique called simpoint, and it's uh, frankly better older brother loop point, which is um, the idea is very simple. You don't simulate the whole system. You simulate small little regions of execution that you can put into a model to give you the data of a full system. They're basically based on the same idea. You divide the execution of your system into equally sized chunks. You cluster them based on their characteristics, and then you only have to execute one from each cluster. And then you can scale up that to your stats. It sounds simple, but actually the technical details behind that are quite complex. The big one for a while was it was something you can only do in single threaded applications. Loop point gets over that th through some magic. Loop point paper as well worth reading. Um, and we do have this implemented in Gem 5, quote, kind of. It requires a lot of setting up, and we're still trying to implement it better. And it's becoming more evident over time through research we've done at UC Davis. So loop point has a very high error rate. So you really are trading off quite a It's one of these trade-offs again. Like Maybe you're only simulating 20% of the, the workload, but the model for extrapolating that is quite uh, yeah, quite poor. How do you choose what to sample, time-based or instruction? Or? So there's this vector that every region is assigned, they call a basic block vector, which mm -hmm. is essentially a model based on uh, basic blocks of execution data, mm -hmm. uh, which for a while everyone thought was great, but uh, I've been told recently that there's faults in this model. It doesn't cluster things very well, or, or as well as they originally thought. So we're really struggling to get this, like, there's dreams of like, oh, if we get this down to like 8% error rate, that'd be great if we could run things 10% of the time. Uh, so we're still working on this, and it's, but if you want to anyway, it's in the code base. There's two example scripts, configs example, gem5, loop points. I also point you towards last year's HPCA tutorial. We had a much bigger piece on it, and that is videotaped online. And I believe the slides are online. Uh, so I'll say it's a way to speed up your application, but it's definitely experimental. Uh, does anyone have any questions on sampling? Again, during your break, you can play around with these scripts if you want. Yeah. When you say integrated, do you mean uh, uh, I can take up someone else's sim points, or I can generate new ones? Uh, so one of the reasons it's not well integrated is the loop point people have their um, First of all, they have, they have their own like executables for uh, basically generating this data you need to create loop points. So you have to kind of take Gen5 data, run it through a few translations to get it in the format this binary wants. You run it in the binary, you get this output, you pass it back to Gen5. And the way you get, the way you divide up the regions of execution is by taking lots of checkpoints. So let's say your region of execution is like, you're, you, you, you would say something like, I'm dividing my uh, run into regions of 10 billion, instru 10 billion instructions or so many more ticks. Yeah. So you just have that uh, Gen5 run script that's set up that every so many ticks, it exits, it takes a checkpoint, goes. And then you run your analysis for each of these divisions. You get your basic block vectors, you cluster them, and then you just theoretically, you pick one. Uh, the problem is there's a lot of back and forth in that. You have to download this binary, you have to translate it. The data format's a bit weird. Uh, it's just, uh, it was basically a master's student project uh, that we kind of carried away with at some point. But people are very interested in this. And I think it has a lot of potential. We just need to figure out how to apply vectors to these um, regions better. Uh, which is, you know, given uh, see, even if you take it single threaded, given a series of instructions, or like a trace, how do you compare these against another trace to be similar, giving similar stats? It seems easy, but you suddenly run into all these problems. 
Uh, so yeah, uh, probably going to be more mature, assuming we can figure out how to get over this problem. Uh, but definitely interesting. And if you want to play around, you definitely can. Uh, there's some, yeah, some working examples. Anyone have anything more to say about some? Mm. Something uh, regarding the caches. So when you let's say sample, uh, you know the execution, mm -hmm. and then you want to run like the next sample. How do you kind of infer what's in the cache and what's been already evicted for the next time you run something? Does that make sense? Or? Uh, I'm not sure if because every single region is really just restoring a checkpoint, mm -hmm. so it works in the same logic there. Okay. Like, you know, we call them regions, but really. It's like, hey, give me, region, give me the region X checkpoint, and that's how you load in your region. So really, uh, realistically, behind, no, like when you have all this matching, all this data, let's say your program has, let's say, 20 regions. Realistically, that's 20 checkpoints, each of which will restore you to that region. Hmm. And then you just figure out what regions you want to run, and then you go for it. You run it so only so many ticks, and then you take your data. You put it into your model, and then you theoretically have uh, a whole system execution. Yeah? If you're not worried about restoring cache, say, before starting a region, could you run all these regions in parallel? Mm. Y yes, uh, that has been, that's done. Yeah, you can, that's another benefit. But FYI, uh, because of just the, almost like just because you're dealing with so many regions sometimes, and you have to figure, you, so it just gets quite complicated in Gen 5 because, say, per region, you've got your checkpoint, and the checkpoint defines a start, and then you've got your warm-up period, and then you've got to do an exit event to clear your stats and get, because you don't want to have stats the warm-up period. It doesn't really make any sense. And then you start the thing, and it just has this multiplicity to it. It just becomes a little bit hard to manage. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it probably will... Uh, be more talked about in the future. And if anyone's interested, I've got someone at UC Davis who will talk your ear off about sampling. Uh, I'm, I just got a bit tired of it after a while. Uh, uh, yeah. I really love that idea. There's something in it like, oh, you just sample a very small amount of something and you can extrapolate and get perfect models, but... Perfect. Yeah, like it works for population stats and everything and somehow you just not with computer, with traces yet. Uh, Okay, this is going to be a summary of everything we've done, but that's just... Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to spend five minutes talking about this. You uh, can go. So yeah, oh yeah, we can have some questions and then, yeah. So in case of sampling, uh, when you are not executing, the parts of the uh, simulation which you are not executing, mm -hmm. are they like run in, are they executed in KVM mode or it's just not... No, it's not, there's no point, uh, there's, there's no reason to execute them because all you do is because you know how long each region is in terms of uh, normally instructions. Uh, so you'll just restore to the beginning of that region. Again, there's this wa weird little warm up dance you need to do, but once you've done that, you just run it for a certain amount of instructions, you end. And then you don't need to care about what happened before or after. And as I said, you can run it in parallel. So you can run region 1, 15, 26, <coughs> and, f and 40 all in parallel. Uh, yeah. You can see the, the elegance in it. Yeah, I uh, it's just we yeah the basic block vector model is quite hard to get into reasonable bounds. Uh, okay, so I uh, just spoiler like when we get back, uh, I'm going to talk you through how to create your own sim objects. Uh, my basic write up here is uh, so far we've been using other people we've been using other people's simulated components, and obviously you want to create your own. And I'm going to walk you through that. Uh, if anyone's, not, if anyone's got any more questions before I go? I feel like an elementary school teacher. Everyone's uh, waiting to go. <laughs> not, not in Gen 5, but do you think there's any way that we can have some conference people to get some like, uh, power cables in here post lunch? Because I'm guessing. You can make I have no idea. Uh, my experience with these is uh, every man for himself. There's some power cables up here if anyone wants to do it. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't mind this place. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so when you give command, the first command is executed after the routine is complete. So this means Gen is aware that OS uh, routine is complete. So right. what, what scenario are you talking about? The sampling? I don't know. Uh, it's not simply yeah. the command. Command. Oh, yeah, the command thing. OK. You specify workload. You give command. And the first command is executed after 
always put in complete, yes. you said? Yes. That means gem simulator knows when the new split is complete. Is it correct? Well, your simulated system knows the boot's complete. Literally all that is is that, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's the bash.rc file in home. <laughs> we, literally, we literally hacked that and said, uh, read file, execute whatever is in read file. What's happening is you go into a bash uh, thread and you're executing that script and it exits at that point. Behind the scenes, it's all clickety clackety cogs and wheels. You know, it's like you, you boot the OS, you automatically run a script on pom boot that runs M5 exit. Uh, it's not very clever. <laughs> it just looks clever. So you yeah. don't touch the kernel code? No, never. Uh, no, I know. No, no, I nothing displayed here has touched the kernel code. By all means, put in uh, people who study kernels will put in exit events inside kernels to say various things. But I've never touched the kernel. So you can take a vanilla kernel, throw it in there, works. Yeah. Uh, that we never had any problem with at least any of the Linux kernels. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the only problem we have is uh, uh, syscalls. Uh, every single time there's new Ubuntu, they add like 500 new syscalls, and then half people compile binaries into a run, and we don't support them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll be. I'll go grab some food at some point. But again, if you want to ask questions, I'll be here. Uh, yeah.